spooky very special halloween edition of the weekly stuff podcast i'm jonathan lack and i'm sean chapman (laughs) and we are here to talk about spooky stuff because it's halloween and we are going to be talking about halloween not the holiday the movie by john carpenter uh i have to say the one by john carpenter because there's three movies called halloween one of which is a remake of halloween one of which is a sequel to halloween we are talking about the 1978 halloween the original the classic the masterpiece uh an episode we've both long wanted to do today is halloween no time like the present uh and i'm also going to rank all the halloween movies because my october project was to finish watching all the ones i'd never seen that was a fucking trip so this is going to be a good one Yes, yeah, and so just to make it very clear for people, we are going to be talking about Halloween on this episode, but we're not going to be talking about Halloween, Halloween, or Halloween, we're just going to be talking about Halloween. Yes, Uh, so yes, we will be talking about that as our main topic later today. Before then, have a little bit of stuff, a little bit of news, some Doctor Who news, uh, some DC and Henry Cavill and Witcher news. I want to talk about the uh, campaign for Modern Warfare 2, which we've both finished. Lots Mm -hmm. of stuff. Sean, do you have anything in particular you want to start with? I mean, I've the uh, I've just been playing Modern Warfare two because the I finished the campaign and then the multiplayer unlocked like two days ago from us recording this, and I've been playing a lot of that as well. Yes, I have not had a ton of time to put into the multiplayer, maybe like three four hours, um, but it's great. I mean, we talked about it mm-hmm. on the beta. It's even better in the full game because you have everything. There's there's tons of good maps. I'm yeah. very impressed. I've been loving the map that is a. It's at a border checkpoint where there's a bunch of cars stalled on the road. That is one of the best Call of Duty maps I've ever seen. Yeah, I think my two favorite maps are that one, and then I really like the one that's, like, it's the biggest map in terms of the normal multiplayer. It's like this bombed city um, that is really, like, it feels like a classic-style modern warfare map. There, It's got, like, a good mix of longer-range lights like uh light sign sight lines that's what i'm trying to say longer range sight lines and like close kind of like urban combat and that mix between those is really well balanced um yeah i've been enjoying um all the maps i've really liked being able to have uh like the full selection of weapons and stuff because i like modern warfare 2019 i really like to play this game at a slower pace um and there weren't a lot of good options in the beta specifically for that kind of like Give me a really high-powered, longer-range rifle that I'm actually going to put a, like, close-range scope on and use in that way. Um, And just, like, play the game very, like, slowly and deliberately. Like, in the previous game, it was the Car 98K and whatever the, like, um, lever-action rifle was were the ones I used a lot. And in this, I've been using the, I think it's called the EBR-10 or whatever. It's a semi-automatic rifle. And then I just unlocked... It's not the Car 98K, so it's not as cool because it's not, like, an old-school you know, wooden furniture style, like mid 20th century uh, bolt action (laughs) rifle. It's like a modern bolt action rifle, but it serves the same gameplay function. Don't remember what the gun's called, but that's the one I've been using a lot now. And it is very satisfying to be able to play the game that way because it's just like the other, the Treyarch Call of Duties and a lot of the other modern Call of Duties just simply don't support that kind of methodical play style. And this game really does. So I've been, yeah, I've been playing a lot of it, particularly yesterday. I... I just like kind of spent the whole day playing Call of Duty. It's been, uh, it's been since 2019 since I've done that, so it felt good. It feels good. It's just you know this is this is about as good as it gets for this kind of 
yeah. I think, shooter multiplayer, at least for you and I. I know everyone has different tastes and different flavors, and some people like their character shooters, or I guess you'd call them character action games or whatever, and some people like their more Black Ops style and, you know, whatever. But uh, this, for I think you and me, is like the best on the market, especially because Halo is mm -hmm. off dying in a ditch somewhere. Yes, yeah. For me, it's either <laughs> play more Master Chief Collection or play this are like the two shooter options that are appealing to me at the moment. Yes, indeed. But it's great. Uh, I did also finish the campaign. Uh, that campaign is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's had very lukewarm critical reception. And it's reminding me a lot of Infinite Warfare a couple years ago. I say a couple. That was like 2016. You know, yeah. Before times. Um, and, you know, that was a game. I think Infinite Warfare is probably still the best Call of Duty campaign yes. I've played. But that one had a very kind of sleepy, tepid reception. This one has also had that. It's also, there are some controversies, some of which I think are very well earned, like the stupid part where you point guns at civilians to de-escalate. That's terrible. Um, yeah. It's also, you know, one small part of the overall campaign. And I think there's some other controversies that are dumber, um, like people maybe trying to take the ridiculous geopolitics too seriously, although I, I won't criticize anyone too harshly for that. It is ridiculous. Um, but I loved it. I, I think just on the level of, you know, gameplay level design, it's an absolute masterpiece. Just level to level. Everyone is so unique. I find all of the different things you do in it so fun. There are parts of this game that I think kind of feel to me like the next level of what Naughty Dog tried to do with Uncharted. Of making these big, playable Hollywood action set pieces. But I think what they've managed to do with Modern Warfare 2 here is do something like that, but make them much more meaningfully playable and, like, strategic for the player. So there's an entire level in Modern Warfare 2 where you're hopping between cars, and it's essentially the, like, truck chase from Raiders mm -hmm. of the Lost Ark, but a completely playable level with different options and strategies and bespoke gameplay elements. And that is just so fascinating to me and so cool and I want to see more of it because this is, it, I don't know, some parts of this game feel like a breakthrough in how to do that kind of like movie inspired action game thing. Yeah, it's very good. And um, like, if anything, I like, I almost feel like my main complaint of the campaign is that there's like almost too many like really unique moments and unique set pieces and unique mechanics. Because I do think that like, I wish there was almost kind of like similar to Uncharted 4, which I had a similar complaint. Like, I kind of wish there was more just kind of meat and potatoes Call of Duty campaign in it. Because there's like long stretches you go where they're like, oh, here's like this crazy new mechanic. Here you're jumping from car to car. Now you're like looking through this like camera and guiding ghosts around. Um, And all those mechanics are really good. Like really, there's not, for me at least, I don't think there was a unique mechanic they came up with that I think was badly implemented. There's a like survival horror kind of level in the game which is fucking crazy it's very last of us inspired um and all that stuff is really interesting i just kind of wish that like for that there was a little bit more like classic call of duty is almost my only real criticism of it um because yeah in general i agree with what you're saying like i think it is amongst the best call of duty campaigns it's up there with um 2019 it's up there with the classic like call of duty 4 and it's definitely up there with Infinite Warfare still being very much the best one. Um, but this this gets to do its very unique combat mechanics and its unique, like, weird uh, sensibility. While also having this just stupidly bonkers action movie plot that uh, that has its stupidest moments. Like, it is the, the press L2 to de-escalate thing is incredibly dumb. It is the most classic the only thing we can do in our video game is shoot people. And so if we wanted to do a nonviolent mechanic, the only way to do it is to mimic shooting people. And it's, and it's like, as soon as it happens, you know that like, oh, well, they're fucked here. Like, you know, it's, this is just a dumb idea. It's poorly implemented. It like reads very badly. Um, but other than that, I think they managed to get away from how like excessively serious the 2019 story was at a certain point to that game's detriment because its geopolitics were so toxic ultimately because it couldn't see or it couldn't like it wasn't bold enough to be able to break away from the like very kind of raw mindset that call of duty will always have because it is call of duty this has that dumb fast and furiousy just like oh it's terrorists and the fucking mexican cartel working together 
um, for no really good reason at all. Uh, and you're jumping around and hopping around the globe and doing ridiculous shit. And you're jumping from like truck to truck in a big crazy chase. Um, it's, you know, the, the Mexican cartel helps these Iranian terrorists smuggle a bomb in or like a missile into Chicago. It's just like fucking dumb. It's such a stupid story. It's got some of the stupidest dialogue you've ever heard, but that helps it in many ways of like, it's much harder to take seriously versus the 2019 game, which very much wanted to be taken very seriously. And at the end did not hold up to that standard. Yeah. Like if you take this as a serious, like political statement of a game, there's a lot of toxic shit in it. Um, I think if you take it more on the level of a Fast and Furious movie, which I do think, like, to the point where I think there's, like, specific influences they're drawing from Fast and Furious in this one, that is yeah. the mode it wants to work in much more clearly, then I think it works actually very well. Like, and, I, you know, even on the geopolitics side, I'm interested that this game has a significant set of characters that are Mexican who you go to, like, you know, their area of the world and help them deal with their shit, and their shit turns out to be an evil American PMC, and you kill all of them, and that's great. And, like, there's real camaraderie between the, like, you know, characters like Price and Gaz and everyone, and the Mexican characters like Alejandro, and, you know, they pick up some Spanish, and the characters who speak Spanish speak Spanish that's subtitled for a lot of the game, and, you know, does that make up for the stupidity of the cartel is helping Iranian terrorists... No, but I do think on the, like, Fast and Furious kind of buddy movie kind of thing that's going on here, it's interesting. And I like the kind of, like, multi-ethnic nature of it. And there's one thing I liked about this game is I like the characters in it a lot. I like mm -hmm. these new interpretations of Price and Ghost. There's really good character writing just in the sense of, like, getting a sense that these are people who have personalities and those personalities are distinct and they're friends and there's a real, like, camaraderie between them. It's not, like, a mean competitiveness. Like, everyone likes each other and they talk about how they like each other and, you know, sometimes you will have the Spanish characters say something and then, or the Mexican characters say things in Spanish and then the English characters will pick something up and they'll say it back and, like, I don't know. I liked all of that. It's charming. It's... Like, mm -hmm. on that level... And that's something I think Call of Duty games actually struggle with. In a lot of games, yes. you have very, you know, bland characters. And part of the fun of it should be you're on a team going on missions, you know? And, like, they get that. There's a very Fast and Furious quality to that. Yeah, it's definitely... I agree. I really... Like, Alejandro is the best character in the game. Like, I love him. Um, He's one of the, the Mexican Special Forces guy. He's, like, the Mexican Special Force guy that's, yeah. like, the main character on that side of the story. Yeah, and you have, like, all of your goofy fucking soap you know with his ridiculous scottish accent and <laughs> gaz and ghost and price and all of them um and you know they split the game generally across those two halves where you have soap and ghost in mexico dealing with the cartel stuff and then you have price and gaz who they were particularly featured in the last game and they're in the middle east and stuff and in europe dealing with the iranian terror side and then it all comes together at the end um you know it definitely you know, it, it, it is nice that you are killing, like, evil Americans at the end, but it does feel like a big cop-out that it's a PMC, you know, and that, like, sure. General Shepard, who's, you know, if you've played the original Modern Warfare 2, you know that General Shepard is probably not a great guy. Um, You know, they kind of, you know, they remix, as the last game did, they remix different concepts from um the classic Modern Warfare games, more so in this than in the 2019 game, which is fun. Um, But it is, like... You know, they, they kind of let that General Shepard get off a little bit light with is like, oh, you know, he had the best intentions of like illicitly smuggling of like an American missiles through the Middle East with no oversight whatsoever. It's Iran-Contra. It it's literally Iran-Contra if yeah. it went really, really bad. Like it's, that's what this game is. And I found that very funny that like, they're like, oh, he had the best intentions. And I'm like, I know Iran-Contra history. They did not have the best intentions. That is yeah. not true. Yeah, they just sort of, like, shove all of that shit onto the evil PMC guy who is, you know, very satisfying to kill. Um, he is a complete jackass. He is a good, like, action movie style villain where as soon as you meet him, you know this guy's a piece of shit and this game is going to end with me killing this guy and that's going to be very fun. Um, and so it's like, it's nice that they take that step that it's like, it is at least... You like this understanding of that the people we are working for are the bad ones, but then it gets offset onto this sort of external group, which feels like it's that it, it just doesn't kind of get all the way there. But it does lead to what is 
both like the best and stupidest thing that happens in the game, which is, um, and all, obviously we're like spoiling the shit out of the story, but I don't think there's really any reason to be <laughs> to avoid spoiling yes. the Call of Duty story. <laughs> uh, but you have that moment, like a couple of levels before the end, where the teams come together and they're like, oh, we can't, you know, we're we're like rogues now. You know, it's like we're going against the people that we work for. We're like not Mexican special forces, nor are we task force 141. We are the ghosts. And fucking ghost takes his mask off and you don't see it, but everyone else sees it. And then Price throws down these like ski masks with a skull fucking painted on it onto the table and it's funny because there's like a room full of like what looks like maybe 30 to 40 guys um obviously most of them are like random background characters they're not really like people that you know but it's this big room full of like all these like other people that they're getting together for this squad and he throws like 10 of those masks down and it's like hey if you if you're in take one of the masks as you're out walk away Nobody will say anything. And then everybody grabs one of the masks. You know, it's the classic done action movie moment. And it is funny that there are nowhere near enough masks for everybody. And that got a chuckle out of me. But the idea that all these like big, like tough fucking like, you know, dude bro, oorah military types are all running around with this stupid fucking ski mask with a stupid fucking uh, skull <laughs> painted on it. Like Ghost, if you think about it in a realistic context, Ghost is the biggest fucking dork in the world like look at me big tough military man and i wear a stupid skull mask all the time because i don't want anyone to see my face it's like if you try to take that character seriously for a second it's just like who the fuck are you and then you learn in that moment that his name is simon which really tracks that that dude you know you know yes. that guy got made fun of in school um and he drew like like skull pictures and he was like a goth kid or whatever in school and now he's, he's simon um, and he wears his dumb skull mask. But now everybody wears the skull mask because we are all the ghosts. I unironically love that moment. I wanted to cheer. It's the perfect dumb action movie. Like, I think the 2000s would be Fast and Furious. 80s, it would be like Rambo or Commando or something. Uh -huh. It's just such a perfect, you know, you've got Ghost. He finally shows his face. They all put the masks on. I loved it. It's dumb as shit and it's great. It's so perfect. Uh, and yes, I did love that his name was Simon. He's into masks. I did. It did hit me because these games have at least aesthetically a more sort of greater you know sense of realism mm -hmm. is the like, I've never been in the military. I'm fairly confident the American military would not allow you to go around on missions wearing a fucking silly ghost ski mask. Yeah. But I don't know. Like, if you, if any of our listeners know the actual answer to that, tell me. I would be shocked if ghost was actually allowed to do that. But there you go. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, I don't know if the idea is, is, is it like armor? Because his thing is actually like, it's like, you know, he looks like a fucking Marvel movie character. It's got yes. like, it's like a plate thingy. Um, So maybe, maybe there he can like use that as an excuse. I mean, he just does it because he wants to be edgy. Um, Like that's right. like, you know, he just wants to be cool. Um, But, but that's maybe the excuse he gets to use in the military. But... It's like, no, it's armor. <laughs> you know, it, it protects my face, the most vulnerable part of any man. I'm also, uh, I am admittedly very confused at who Price and all his people are, because in the original Modern Warfare games, they are a British military unit. Yeah, they're part of the SAS. Right. In this, they are all British and Scottish and like from the UK, but they're in an American military task force. Is, is that right? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, don't I mean, think yes, about it they're, I mean, they're all working for the CIA in this game. Like, because you have yes. Laswell, who is your... Um, the the lady from you know uh, Zero Dark Thirty obviously is like a real person also, um, but it's very much based off of that character, and she was in the last game. Um, but yes, but I but like because you had a whole like American side in the last game, right? With like um the guy the CIA guy who's like with Farah and all that stuff. None of that is. I mean, you have one mission where Farah from the last game shows up. But yes, like it is just now mysteriously Task Force 141 seems to be exclusively working for the CIA. I don't know if that makes sense in the lore of modern warfare or not. Um, I also scratched my head at that at a certain point of like, so who am I like, why, why are we working for the Americans? Like, why are all the people giving orders Americans, but all the people doing this shit are like British and Scottish? Right. <laughs> it is. It's funny. They should have just, they should have added an Irish guy. They should yeah. have added a Welshman. Just like yes. make it very representative of the UK, but not of America. And that would make me laugh very hard. Um, yes. the cartoon Frenchman in the next one. Just expand it to Europe. Go to the continent. I think it could be fun. 
Can I talk about, um, okay, well, in terms of levels and everything, I talked about the, the car level is amazing. I really loved the Last of Us-esque survival mission. Mm-hmm. That is just a great piece of game design that, like, stretched, I think, the Call of Duty, you know, concept. Like, honestly, I kind of want a whole game like that. It was really well done, I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know how you would stretch it out beyond the whole game, because, of course, the whole play of that level is getting strong enough to take on these big soldiers. And once you have that, you don't need the survival stuff as much. But it was very cool. I like how they brought it back for, like, the final boss, too. Um, yeah. But my favorite part of the game in a story s- s- sense, uh, because it triggered my nostalgia, and I also thought it was just very, very funny. And I'm going to spoil the very end of the game here, so if you don't want to know, skip ahead a little bit. Um, the end of the game is you've got Laswell, the CIA lady you were talking about, and she's in a bar drinking with Captain Price. And she says, like, uh, and, and, and Captain Price is like, all these threats, the Iranians and the cartel. And she says, and now we've got these Russian ultranationalists. And I went... They're doing it. They're doing the ultranationalists again. And then she says, they're led by someone, but we don't know his name. He's a ghost. And she pulls out a picture and Price looks at it and he's like, that's no ghost. And he hands it down the line and it turns <laughs> out that Gaz and Soap and Ghost are all there. And they all look at it and they're all like, oh my God. And then they pass it back up and she says, who is it? And Price turns to camera and with me, because I said it with him, went, yeah. Makarov. And I went, Yeah. <laughs> because it's such a that's the villain from the original modern warfare trilogy and there was just something about like we're going back to the ultra nationalists which is this stupid mid-2000s thing that call of duty and some other games used and we're bringing back makarov and we're making the russians the big bads again and i'm just like this is dumb as shit and i love it yeah i mean it's particularly it's the shot where like where it shows that it's not just price in laswell like sitting at this bar alone because there's you know there's some kind of chemistry between price and laswell um yes. there's you know they clearly have some sort of history together you know um and, but then instead of it just being this sort of like you know little like intimate get together between the two of them it's like no there's also these three meatheads just sitting like <laughs> you know it's like an l-shaped counter and laswell and price are sitting at the corner of one end of the l and then it took the camera perspective shifts and you see the other end of the l and it's just their whole three lined up sitting there uh with drinks and it's yeah that that <laughs> got the biggest chuckle out of me by far um you have makarov which who i guess will be back in in modern warfare 3 no russian Um, Because there is a no Russian callback as well in the little, like, teaser at the end. Yes, indeed. Uh, They did not make you play it this time. I think they hopefully learned their lesson from the probably... Is that the most distasteful thing a Call of Duty campaign has done? Is no Russian? Or do you think they've done something worse since then? That's probably... That is probably it. I mean, they always tried to, like, one-up it with, like, a being... You know, because there's something in, like, Modern Warfare 3 where it's, like, a family of civilians that get blown up or so i can't remember um like that there was is, but you don't but it's not a long level where yeah. you walk through shooting them you know but it was always it always felt like they put in here's like the one thing that's going to that at the beginning we're going to have our content warning that will disable this scene you know yes. um but none of it ever like got to the point of no russian where you're participating in this attack um on civilians and, and mowing people down um yeah which was pretty fucking crazy especially like it was crazy at the time it's like weird to think back on it uh because that would be as controversial if they did it now if not more than at the time there aren't a lot of things in media that age in that specific way no. yeah so anyway i look warts and all i really enjoyed this campaign i'm excited for the next one this is my shit even when it's kind of stupid there's a part of me that just having grown up with stupid call of duty is like I it's kind of a warm blanket. I see Call of Duty do a crazy story and I'm like I'm home. This is I'm a kid again. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Um I do before we move on, I do want to talk about some of the dialogue in the game because there are some yes. just like incredibly dumb lines. Um I talked about last time that what was my um favorite one but you hadn't gotten to it yet and there are two because you texted me one that i had forgotten about that is also very funny where you were wondering if it was the one i was thinking about um and that line is oh yeah do you want to do it so yes there's terrorists are all about the past narcos are all about the future and i texted you like sean is it that line and i actually when i brought up my the the text i sent you i have another text i never sent you because i think this was like one in the morning and i stopped myself because i went oh sean's probably asleep he has to work in the morning is the line you were thinking of terrorism is good for business it's insurance 
No, but that is a very good. I think, but I think that's from the scene because okay. the line okay. I'm thinking from is is they get the lady who is the like drug lord or whatever, um, who is like disguised as the number two. There's a whole like weird hitman fucking level in this game where you're like <laughs> infiltrating a cartel um like base and you have to figure out who the like the head honcho is i mean it's this lady but she has this line and this is the only line and, and i think that like it's again i'm pretty sure it's part of the scene that that line was from as well where she like it's the only point where they try to justify this absolutely bonkers premise where iranian terrorists are working with the mexican drug cartel a combination of two factions that should have absolutely fucking nothing to do with each other um <laughs> and she says as long as there's a war on terror there will be no real war on drugs and that is her justification as long as as long as there's a war on terror there will be no real war on drugs i'm like I don't think you know what either of those things are. I don't think you don't think you have a concept of like what we meant by the war on drugs in like the Reagan years, you know? Like I don't think you understand anything of this. And this the idea that like the cartel are actively supporting Iranian terrorists, which by the, which puts like a massive fucking target on your back when you're like supporting like She's saying that in a scene with CIA operatives who yes. have come to get her. Like it's kind of proves the point, lady. Yeah, it's like, it's just like the idea that that's what her strategy is to try to like keep, you know, the heat off of her big massive drug organization is to support Iranian terrorists because as long as, as long as there's still terrorists out there for them to fight, they're not going to come for us. Is like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard a character try to say as they are being interrogated because they helped out Iranian terrorists and they're part of the war on terror now. Uh, that is amazing. I had forgotten that line. Uh, it's amazing though that you said there was this one dumb line and I sent you two and neither of them were it because yeah. there's so many good dumb ones. Yeah. Uh, no, that's amazing. I mean, what she's describing is the war on drugs is the American police state at home yes. and the war on terror is the American police state abroad. They're really the same thing. It just depends on where you are in the world. Yeah. And it's just like, because I think like the concept of that, like, oh, I guess she thinks that like, if America wasn't sending American troops over to the Middle East, we would, like, invade Mexico to go fight the <laughs> drug cartels? Like, is that what she thinks is going to happen? Like, that's fucking crazy. Like, even with how insane the world is and how insane America is, the idea that America would go fight the cartel in Mexico as, like, a, like, dedicated military operation where we're invading that country, that's, that's on another fucking level. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I love this game. It's so stupid. That character, though, she rocks. I yes. want a whole game about her. She was cool. I just want the Call of Duty cartel where you are running the cartel with this cool lady and doing that. Uh, just a very amoral Call of Duty. I think it'd be great. I say that. Most Call of Duties are very amoral, but you know yes. what I mean. Yeah. No, yeah. She, El, El Sin Nombre. Um, El yeah, Sin that nombre. character is very good. And I like that level. I like that it just becomes Hitman for a level. It's, yeah. it's a blast. I mean, it's a Hitman where... The shooting starts pretty quickly, and once it does, it's Call of Duty shooting, so it's a little different than Hitman, but I liked it. Yeah, but it, it, it does feel like you could have, like, if you, like, turned a corner, you could have seen fucking Agent 47 strangling a dude with a grot wire and, like, putting his clothes <laughs> on. It's like, oh, I guess someone else is, is doing some shit here, too. Yeah. Hey, I'll look the other way if you do. All right. No, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm enjoying the multiplayer. There's And there's more to come because we've got different mm -hmm. multiplayer things they're going to be adding. And eventually there's going to be Warzone and I'm curious about that. The install is not as big as it could be on my Xbox. It's about 100 gigs. Modern Warfare 1 was about 200 sitting on there. So We'll give it know. a little bit of time and we'll get there, you know. Um, yes. Yeah, they. I do not think that they have fixed their problems no. um, in that regard. This is definitely... That that is probably the most disappointing thing about this game. Um, is is like I generally really like almost everything about it, but it is a big, weird, unwieldy mess. Um, in this in a very similar way to every other Call of Duty game for like the past five years. Um, I really was hoping they would get more of their shit together. You know, maybe maybe whenever we get the next gen exclusive ones, maybe that's when we'll finally get to like cut whatever the fuck is going on with their tech or whatever's happening that is causing like that whole thing to be this weird monster of a game that it is 
it's weird did you see what they're doing with boxed copies of the game that the discs are just empty discs with 75 megabytes on them and then it downloads the whole game which on the one hand there shouldn't be boxed copies of this game it makes absolutely no sense because the Mm -hmm. game is bigger than any disc 100 gigabytes you would need the biggest 4k blu-ray a triple layer 4k blu-ray the ps5 can do that i don't believe the xbox series x can for games so that's a no-go anyway but also the data in this game gets updated in such crazy ways it would be like making a boxed copy of genshin impact there's no logic to it Mm -hmm. but at the point where you're just selling a blank disc why not just sell a code in the box like that is such a horrific waste of plastic to make all these blu-rays with nothing on them why other than if you just want to trick people then why do it yeah it's weird because particularly like why not just put the campaign on there at least like sure, you know yeah. obviously like i get it if you didn't you know i think there is still split screen technically but i can't imagine there are many people this is like call of duty isn't like halo where it has a long history of split screen so i don't think like people would be particularly upset if there wasn't the multiplayer stuff on the disc but theoretically and this is this is a big like theoretically they're meant to the idea is that the campaign in the multiplayer stuff is modular so you should be able to have the campaign installed without the rest of the stuff now we saw that with modern warfare 2019 that's kind of bullshit and that game just makes you download everything no matter what um this has the same like campaign pack one campaign pack two like all that shit is still here which as soon as i saw that i was like oh fuck you guys fucked it up again because i don't know why are there multiple campaign packs why is there just a thing that says this is the campaign and this is the multiplayer i don't know why there are individual packets that are pieces of each of those things but you need to have all of them to play them it's very confusing but if their shit worked you should be able to just put the campaign on the disc and at least be able to play that because that's single player content, you know? Um, yeah, it's it's dumb. If you're going to make it so that the disc is just an activation code and that's it, uh, just put a code in the box because there are games that do that. You know, they sell like, they sell copies of like Fortnite with like, you know, like currency or whatever in GameStops, but it's just you get a little slip of paper that has a code on it. You know, there are digital games that have physical sales technically at retailers but it is just a code like you're buying fucking microsoft points back in the day or like a psn gift card or something it's the same sort of thing just do that if that's what you have to do yeah it's i mean i would never buy this game on disc anyway because it's the kind of game i don't want to have to like swap discs in and mm-hmm. out of yeah. but you know this event essentially or uh, especially makes it baffling but oh well otherwise i'm liking the game do you want to talk about the news a little bit what's going on in the news jonathan Well, I want to follow up on our Doctor Who segment from last week where we live reacted to the, uh, I think it's okay to spoil it now, it's been out there long enough, the regeneration of the 13th Doctor into the 14th Doctor who looks a lot like the 10th Doctor. Uh, We have since, because we were recording that literally like the episode had just aired and I sent you the clip. I mean, the the episode had aired while we were recording the podcast. That is what we mean by it had just aired. Uh, It had not aired when we had started recording the podcast. Yes. So it was very immediate. We didn't have any details. Now we have a week's worth of details. Different things have come out. So for one, uh, Russell T. Davis, who is coming back to run the show, he and the BBC are calling this new David Tennant Doctor the 14th, and they're calling Shudi Gatwa the 15th Doctor. So that'll be interesting. You know, who knows if they're still fucking with us in verbiage, but that is how they are referring to it. Um, They've confirmed that we already knew that the David Tennant, there would be three of those. Those are three specials that are airing in November 2023 for the 60th anniversary, so they're not spreading them out over the year. It'll be like a mini season that November. Mm -hmm. The premiere is directed by Rachel Talalay, which is awesome. Uh, The other two directors are newcomers to Doctor Who. Um, Not newcomers to directing, obviously, just to Doctor Who. Uh, Russell T. Davies is writing all three of those. We'll have Catherine Tate in those, blah, blah, blah. Kind of stuff we knew, but just getting some confirmation, which is nice. And then the 14th season of the show, starring the 15th Doctor, uh, Shudi Gatwa, will begin over the, they said, the holiday period. So I think they're probably still unsure. Are they doing a Christmas special, New Year's special? Chris Chibnall moved it from Christmas to New Year's. We'll see if they move it back. But we'll get his debut somewhere around there, and then we will get a full season. And then the big, big news is that Doctor Who is moving Uh, internationally from where it has aired in the past I mean depending on where you are in the world it's aired in a lot of different places here in the United States uh, in the Russell T Davies era one like Eccleston and Tennant it aired on sci-fi then starting with Matt Smith it aired on BBC America 
now uh, in the UK and Ireland. It is airing on the BBC, on your BBC iPlayer, all of that stuff. And everywhere outside of the island of the United Kingdom and Ireland, it is airing on Disney+. Plus, And it will be a Disney Plus exclusive going forward. Um, and we learned just the other day that Disney is putting money into the show. It is not just a licensing agreement. They are a co-producing partner. This is not the same as Disney buying Doctor Who. It's not, you know, Doctor Who is going to be in a Marvel movie tomorrow, but it is Disney is a co-producing partner here with uh, Russell T. Davis's Bad Wolf Productions, which is taking over production of the show. Uh, so one upside of this is Russell T. Davis has cobbled together a massive cash infusion for Doctor Who, mm-hmm. unlike anything it has ever had before. There are some other like thornier issues to talk about, including, I gotta say, Sean, reading in between the lines, it really sounds like BBC was ready to cut the rope on this show. Yeah. And that I think Russell T. Davies coming in with David Tennant with a big marketable 60th anniversary event, getting the participation of Disney, getting a bigger international footprint. I think RTD might have brought the show back from death a second time without the show technically being canceled. Yeah, that's kind of my read for it as well. Um, And that's always like it's always sort of felt like that even before the Disney thing, because we already knew that Bad Wolf Productions was effectively as taking over um and so there was always this sense of like doctor who is not a, like an exclusively bbc made thing anymore um and then now that's like especially true with disney pitching in money as well um but yes i think i have the same feeling that it feels like the bbc was ready to say you know what we're good um especially because i don't think like there's not as far as we can tell there's not anybody else who's like lined up to be the showrunner you know, there's not like a, someone to take over for Chris Chibnall um, other than Russell T. Davis, right? Like, you know, going back to someone who used to do it. But there's not like a new face that seems sort of like in the hot seat, eager to take over that spot. Um, and so hopefully like what we like Russell T. Davis can can bring the show back, make it popular again, modernize it and update it and make it appealing to um, like our modern streaming sensibilities. You know, this is obviously also part of like Disney Plus has slowly been expanding its like array of shows um, outside of like the core Disney stuff. They've been licensing, they've been getting in the anime game. They've been licensing some anime stuff and stuff like that. So um, this is part of that push as well. So if. Well, and Disney. Sorry, I was just going to say Disney Plus, if you're only following it in the US, Disney Plus so far has all been Disney content. In the rest of the world, Disney Plus also has all of their Hulu, Fox, Mm -hmm. FX content. So, like, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia airs on Disney Plus in the rest of the world, which sounds ridiculous. But, like, that is how they have a separate network called Star. So, Disney Plus is a much bigger repository worldwide. And they are eventually, we know, going to do that in the U.S. But there's, like, other, like, they do not yet own hulu completely so that they can dissolve it blah 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 Mm. but this is the plan and so doctor who is clearly a cog in that larger plan yeah um so for us d davis can like sort of use that to help push the show out both to like i think an existing audience that has fallen off of it where it's like you know we on this podcast are not on an island of people who were way into the show i mean we covered the show as it aired weekly since season seven up to season 11 and then after season 11, we were like, yeah, we're good. Um, and so there's like an existing audience that I think is ready to come back. That is like the David Tennant play, right? Um, but then I think there's also a new audience that the show has not attracted for years at this point of like potential viewers that getting it on Disney Plus, like getting it some more money, like giving it like a fresh look and everything can hopefully get the show be more popular again and then attract uh, someone new who could then take over the showrunner role um, after Russell T. Davis is done with however long he wants to be back on the show for. Yeah, I think the streaming play is just, if it wasn't Disney, it had to be someone because I think one of the biggest barriers to Doctor Who has been the BBC America of it all, the patchwork Mm -hmm. global release. Like if you, again, I don't know about some other countries and where it's aired, but in the United States anyway, if you have wanted to watch Doctor Who legally, it has been a goddamn nightmare yes. because your options are have a cable package and watch it on BBC America where it does air the same day, but it airs with commercials. The episodes get all chopped up. Sometimes there's stuff missing. It's just the video quality is obviously awful because it's on cable. 
um, and then it doesn't stream anywhere. And mm-hmm. so your other option is to like buy a season pass on iTunes, which just me saying that makes me sound like I'm 50 years old because uh-huh. that's not a thing people do anymore. Uh, and so like that was your other option or you pirate it. And that's what most people did is they just pirated it. And it was a problem for everybody because the show was just so much easier to pirate than to watch legally. Right. Yeah. And putting it on streaming is going to solve that problem. Some people will still pirate it, but it's going to be much easier now to just watch it legally because Disney plus is an easy thing to access. Uh, so it, it had to move to streaming eventually. This just had to happen. Um, and it's going to have a much, much bigger audience because Disney plus's reach is like exponentially bigger is still too small to say it is exponentially Mm -hmm. bigger than BBC America. This is the biggest platform Doctor Who has ever had outside the UK. Um, the BBC is, you know, in the UK is still very accessible to people who live there. There's the iPlayer, all of that stuff as I understand it. Um, but that's just not how TV works here in the U S and in other parts of the world. So you know, that alone, I think, was probably the biggest distribution hurdle Doctor Who had to clear, and they've cleared it, and that is, that's a good omen for the future, because I'm fully confident this will be popular. Like, yes. this will be, especially coming back with David Tennant, that's going to be a huge event. It's going to be over the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S. It's going to be on streaming. That's just going to be huge. And then moving into the Shooty Gatwa era, I just think, like, I can imagine that being a big thing every single week. Because Disney Plus also, they do weekly releases. They've always, like, they've been very smart about they never went the Netflix route of doing the stupid binge drops. And so Disney, I feel like 50 weeks a year, someone is talking about something new on Disney Plus. Whether it's a new episode Mm -hmm. of She-Hulk or a new episode of, right now it's Andor or something. And Doctor Who will be in that rotation when it's on the air. And that will be huge for it. Yes, and it means that we will we'll be able to do Doctor Who again on this podcast. Yes. Like I had that realization the other day when I was looking at some of this stuff and being like, "Oh my god, we'll we could we could do like weekly coverage of Doctor Who again." It's been years literally since we it's did been that. Years. Yeah, it's going to be fun. You know, I think there's a part of me that doesn't love the idea of Disney having any kind of creative or business input in Doctor Who. Um When it's Russell T. Davis writing, I don't really worry because he is a big voice and a big name and has his own kind of force of gravity. Uh, I worry if it were someone like newer, but that's a down the line problem for now. And again, Disney has not bought Doctor Who. I would be sadder if they had just bought Doctor Who and put it in the cupboard with everything else. That would depress me, but we're not there yet. Yeah, and hopefully we never get there. Hopefully this is just a... You know, they they kick in some money, they get the, you know, the distribution rights and stuff. Um, they get to, you know, be like, Hey, we we're the home of Doctor Who now, but without ever having to like go the full hurdle of and now we're we're the people also making it. Um and now it is it's American Doctor Who. Guess what? <laughs> Chris that is, that Hemsworth is, is Doctor Who. Yes. Wait, no, he's also you know what? That could work. Uh I would need a like Chris Evans is Doctor Who. There you go. Um it's anyway. just Mickey Mouse. We just he regenerates into a cartoon mouse. Here we go. <laughs> that that would actually be kind of interesting. No, it's uh you know it's a it's a bold new era for Doctor Who. It feels like it's finally kind of coming into the modern TV era, and that is good because you know Chibnall did all these very superficial things to try to do that. Like he changed the aspect ratio of the show and shot on newer digital cameras and shit like that. And that's just superficial garbage. No one cares. This actually feels like a meaningful rethinking of of how the show could air. So yes, yeah. I'm also going to call my shot that I'm I'm going to put my chips down that I don't think that they're going to maintain this new David Tennant as the 14th Doctor. I think that that is a classic RTD marketing stunt that he has done multiple times at this point with the <laughs> the the twist at the end of the of season four where the Doctor regenerates and then you get the fucking Meta Doctor or whatever. Then he did the next to Doctor, right, with that one special. So he has done this sort of, like, song and dance a couple of times. It's totally possible that he'll be, they'll be, like, insistent in the official marketing and, like, continue to call this second iteration of David Tennant the 14th Doctor. But my guess is that this is some sort of thing where I think we're going to get, like, Shuti Gatwa to some extent within those three episodes. Not just as a after like post-regeneration scene there's like that little clip you see of him in the trailer i think he there's some sort of like mental like internal space or something where his regeneration has been deliberately fucked with by the neil patrick harris character that is probably the celestial toy maker 
um and that it will be a like weird thing where it's not a real regeneration until shirigawa comes out that is my interesting guess. yeah i think that's probably that sounds like that could work it could be very fun uh we'll have to do an episode on the celestial toy maker now because we're bringing that guy back <sighs> I don't know if we wanted to do an episode, you know, uh, I don't know if that's the first Doctor One worth revisiting. Of of the racist episodes of Doctor Who, that might be the most, the most, uh, wow. it is in that very old school 60s way. Um, if you thought the Talons of Wang Shiang was kind of racist, let's meet the Celestial Toymaker. Did you see that, uh, this actually wound up not being the case, but Liz Truss, who resigned as British PM after 44 days, very nearly became the first British Prime Minister since Doctor Who premiered to not have an episode of Doctor Who on her watch. Mm -hmm. And it wound up, she did get in under the, under the because Jodie Whittaker's last episode aired the day before Rishi Sunak took over. Um, but if that had not, if like Rishi Sunak had taken over a day earlier, she would have been the first one because even the like 80s and 90s or the 90s and aughts Prime Ministers, there was like this, the TV movie and then Eccleston premieres in 95 Every British PM had had one. Liz Truss, very close to being the first one. That would have been a very funny piece of history. Yes, well, she she dodged that bullet amongst the many, many bullets that she did not dodge uh, in no. her, for her short career as the Prime Minister of the UK. It's a plenty It's a plenty funny piece of history without that. But, yes. you know, yes. Anyway, uh, thank you, British politics, for being so ridiculous. Although, also, frankly, your politics are much healthier than ours because you're able to get rid of a Liz Truss after 44 days. I think that's actually a healthy sign for your country. Anyway, I mean, healthy in the sense of, like, yeah. hopefully you don't get there at all, but there you go. Anyway, um, what's going on with The Witcher and Superman and Henry Cavill? There's some stuff going on here, Sean. So Yeah, he's, he's, he has been witched. He has been witched. The, so, okay, let's back up for a second. The the train of events here is interesting. So last week, the new DC movie Black Adam came out with Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Black Adam. I have not seen it yet. Did you go see it on your own and not tell me? No. Okay. <laughs> to the so shock of nobody, I did not go see a, a movie in the movie theater. Okay, neither of us has seen Black Adam, but in the end credit scene of Black Adam, there is a scene with Henry Cavill reprising his role as Superman. And this is the first time Cavill has played Superman since Justice League. Uh, it feels like maybe not that long because the Snyder Cut of Justice League only came out two years ago, but that was all shot in 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, and he has not reprised the role since. So he was back as Superman when the movie came out a couple days later, he got on Twitter and Instagram and said, hey, I am back. We're doing more stuff as Superman. Then we learned that they have restructured DC and James Gunn is actually taking over uh, DC films, basically in the kind of Kevin Feige role. Uh, James Gunn is sort of taking the reins to try to... Uh, DC, basically, they have never had a person over there to like oversee it all. So they have decided... It's James Gunn and one other guy who's like a more traditional executive. And I'm forgetting his name at the moment. Um, but it is an attempt to try to steer the DC ship in a firmer, better direction. And part of that is they are going to do more Superman stuff, and they're sticking with Henry Cavill as the character, which on a continuity level makes absolutely no sense to me, but we'll see. Then this weekend, we learn that The Witcher, the Netflix show that has aired extraordinarily sporadically, there was mm -hmm. a first season like five years ago, then like three years after that, there was season two. Season three is premiering next year sometime. They announced that they had renewed it for season four, but they were recasting. Henry Cavill was leaving and starting in season four, Geralt of Rivia will be played by Liam Hemsworth, the Hemsworth brother who was in the Hunger Games, I think. And that's where things are going. I'm confused by all of it. Yeah, I, you know, uh... So neither of us have seen season two of The Witcher. Um, it seemed. To I don't get... know if anyone has. It came and went, and there was no hype. My dad watched it. He seemed to like it. Okay, okay. He, okay. he wasn't super into it. Um, but yeah, like it's a thing I've been meaning to go back to. I'll probably still watch it at some point when I get back into Witcher stuff. At some point, I'll get like the urge to read the books again, and then when that happens, I'll be like, yeah, I might as well watch the TV show. And I assume that that's what will happen. I will probably not watch the Liam Hemsworth one because I. Just, I can't, I can't imagine it. It's like, I can't picture it. 
I can't. It's it's like Henry Cavill was. He ended up being quite good, but it was also I think a long road to being able to be like, okay, I can see it work. Um, I it's that that is not a path that I think we will ever be able to cross. That Liam Hemsworth will be like a good choice for Geralt. Um, yeah, but it's all weird. Like because particularly because Henry Cavill was such a like fighter for that show you know he's so been like so openly passionate about it he's a big fan of the games he's a big fan of the books he like was going hard for that show on like press tours and stuff like that um and social media and everything and it was like in like it feels like that show happened because and that it kept going because he was like we got to do the witcher shit it's it can be really good um, and so that was the thing that was most surprising to me is that I've just always got the impression he is like legitimately way, way into the Witcher and he really loves doing it. Um, and so then all of a sudden being like, and we're, and especially it's like, and where it's not the next, like the next season's going to come out wherever, but the one after that, it's going to be Liam Hemsworth. It's just like a very weird announcement to see on social media. It's weird in so many ways because like, Look, I've talked before that I think Hollywood is too allergic to recasting, and this is a problem I've had, um, and I enjoy when shows embrace the recast, like The Crown does this very well, House of the Dragon on HBO wound up doing this spectacularly well, I think it can be done in really good ways. It's a little different when it is the lead of your show, and it's an ongoing continuity, and it's not Doctor Who where they regenerate, and you just suddenly recast. And there isn't a, an event like a death or someone gets arrested or, you know, whatever the case may be, right? Like, there are other externalities you can imagine. Um, obviously, if Henry Cavill had tragically died and they recast it, I'd still be confused by the Liam Hemsworth of it all. But, like, I wouldn't be confused by the recasting. Like, yeah, tell the story. I just don't know of a recent high-profile case where, like, a big show recast like that in the middle of it you know and there wasn't yeah. an age jump or because not just age Liam Neeson or Liam Neeson Liam Hemsworth is a solid decade younger than mm -hmm. Henry Cavill they are going to be making him look younger more boyish you know softer basically <laughs> it's just to insult I don't mean to insult Liam Hemsworth I'm sure he's a nice guy he doesn't look anything like Geralt of Rivia um but that's just weird and you know I think people I lay out the Superman and DC stuff because I think people are connecting the dots that they must be related. I'm not so sure. Like, I can't think of, like, a clear... Like, there, I can think of scenarios where, like, schedules would overlap and it would become a problem. It's hard for me to imagine a case where that would become so intransigent that for pure scheduling reasons, he would drop out of The Witcher. Like... The Witcher, again, has aired sporadically. And it's not that, like, in the two years between seasons, he is on set every day playing Geralt. That's not how it works. There would be time to do both of these. There have been some rumblings that he might have been creatively dissatisfied with the direction of the show. And I'm curious if that has something to do with it. I'm curious if it is a salary dispute with Netflix, who is really tightening their purse strings and... I am going to guess that Liam Hemsworth is a substantially cheaper mm -hmm. option than Henry Cavill. Um, and that, you know, The Witcher is an expensive show and maybe they are telling that show to just tighten its belt. I don't know. But like Henry Cavill, as you said, I think he seemed like a stretch for Geralt at the beginning because I think he's he was a little too young, too handsome, too chiseled. But he's a good actor and I think made up for it and was a very good Geralt. Liam Hemsworth is like boyish good looks Disney prince not mm -hmm. Geralt at all and so that honestly sounds to me like the CW version of the Witcher airing next to Archer or something like that's who you would get for it uh and I'm just generally confused by it yeah it's yeah it's very weird because you're right like the juxtaposition of the Superman thing and then the Witcher thing makes you want to put those two things together but especially when it's like I mean, we don't have, do we have any idea when the fourth season is even going to come out? Like all this stuff is oh, off in the future. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like this isn't the next season that's about to air or something. And there's, you know, some sort of crazy scheduling thing that, well, fuck, I just have to choose between Superman and Carol. Like that doesn't make sense. So there, presumably there has to be something else going on behind the scenes that made Henry Cavill want to walk away from the show. Uh, but it definitely, I just can't imagine people like the general audience maintaining their interest in that show for season four. Like, I don't know how like popular season two was. 
Um, I just said like it was it's it's always hard to gauge with Netflix stuff because I know that it is always like the most watched streaming stuff, but nobody ever it's never gets like viral at least in our like spheres. So it's like it's thing it's a thing you know is theoretically popular way out there in the universe to some extent, um, but you just never are confronted with it in any way. Um, so maybe The Witcher season two did extremely well for them. I have no idea, um, but I just it's really hard to imagine a general audience being like willing to move past you recasting the main character for someone who is like you know without seeing his performance on the face of it seems like a very massive downgrade from Henry Cavill like certainly at least from a like objective standpoint in terms of like their careers and the kinds of projects they have been in and the kind of audience that they could potentially draw in an objective sense it's a clear downgrade it's almost certainly in a like subjective artistic sense going to be a downgrade as well um and why would you want to push through that to continue watching that show um if your main character is now not your main character anymore basically in terms of what have the like relationship you have developed with them yeah and you know as some people have pointed out netflix essentially does not do more than two or three seasons of anything at this point there are a couple of like older shows they did like house of cards and orange is the new black that got to that length um but in terms of newer stuff you have to be like grandfathered in like stranger things or the crown and otherwise they just don't go past two or three seasons it's it's and it's kind of a rule for them and so that was always kind of my concern with the witcher i do wonder if the witcher getting to season four meant budget cuts and like that's what we're seeing and who the hell knows it i just think that it is almost certainly a much bigger thing going on here than he has to go do Superman, you know? Because my guess also is Henry Cavill would be much more passionate about Geralt than Superman in a vacuum, um, just mm -hmm. looking at his work with the two. But on the DC of it all, I mean, are you interested in seeing him do Superman again? I don't know. I haven't liked okay. any of the movies he's been in as Superman. I haven't seen the Zack Snyder cut, so maybe that would change. And I don't think he's like bad but i can't evaluate his performance of superman because his movies have been bad sure. and he hasn't been asked to play superman in the movies that i have watched um which is three of the four if you count the yeah. two justice leagues as two different movies which i imagine you should um it's yeah so like i'm excited that that dc will be doing more stuff with superman because i like superman as a character and i want them to make a good superman thing um but i'm not like drawn to the project inherently because henry cavill is coming back that's like a whatever to me like i need to see what are they going to do with the character what is their project going to be will they make like a positive feeling uplifting opt optimistic feeling superman that's kind of what i want uh, or or are they going to go edgy dark superman which i'm uh, sick and fucking tired of you know we are now in this era where we're getting all these adaptations of the edgy dark pseudo superman characters from indie comics and stuff like that from the 90s and early 2000s like the boys um and so we are in this era again where we're getting all these like dark evil versions of superman all the time not to say that man of steel is like that was an evil version of superman but it was not a like positive feeling representation for superman um i would really like for them to do that i don't know if that is what they're going to do though yeah you know i I like Henry Cavill as Superman. He's fine. And I, you know, I do think like he was good in Man of Steel. I did like him in the Snyder Cut of Justice League. Part of that also is they had him in the black post-resurrection suit, which is just an awesome Superman costume and looked really good. Um, and he was good at that. But like, he hasn't had a ton to play, I think, to really evaluate him as Superman. And my general thought is that Man of Steel is 10 years old next year. Mm -hmm. That's not a new movie. Um like, I just don't really understand why you wouldn't start fresh. Like, this is an opportunity. James Gunn's coming in. He's kind of revamping things. Henry Cavill, even if he were a obviously phenomenal Superman, he brings this weird continuity baggage with him. Not his fault, but he does is tied to all the Snyder stuff. Um, it feels like a distraction. I don't know why you don't just do what they did with Robert Pattinson in The Batman and just start mm -hmm. fresh. Find who is the Matt Reeves to this thing. Who is the talented filmmaker who has a vision for Superman? Give them a $200 million and let them make their movie. And it will probably work. You know, like that's the kind of thing that could do very well. And I don't know why that's not the vision, but who the hell knows? We also don't know that like he is going to be the primary Superman. It's entirely possible. It's like, this is a couple of cameos 
in it, some of these upcoming movies. Mm-hmm. There's no real indication that like he's back and they're making a Superman trilogy or something, you know? Who yeah, I mean, knows? yeah, because you're right. They haven't even, while well, like Henry Cavill said like, yeah, I'm doing more Superman stuff. They didn't like announce and I'm back in Superman 7 or whatever. We're picking up the continuity. We're, we're putting all of its multiverse Superman or fucking whatever they would do. Um, yeah, so we don't really know at all what they're doing. I really hope that they're not going to try to do a big, like, we're doing the DCU again, man. We're trying to, it's going to be big universe stuff and we're trying to keep it in big crossovers and we're trying to replicate the Marvel stuff because the Batman was so good. I just want them to keep doing stuff like that. Like, as you say, find a good filmmaker who has a good idea and has a passion to make a movie with those characters in like the limited circumstances where a crossover would make sense. Maybe you could do a crossover, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to care about continuity in the DC movie universe. Like I just don't, you know, I, I don't have the energy for it. I barely have the energy for it with Marvel, you know, uh, at this point. So I, I hope that that is not the thing that they're like having James Gunn do is trying to reboot or rebuild or start or like continue on with or whatever the DC expanded cinematic universe and build off that kind of continuity or make a new continuity. I just want to do, if you're going to do movies, like do individual movies with those characters that are their own style and their own take. And then that's fucking it. Yeah. It's, it's all so confused. Like James Gunn made the show Peacemaker, which is phenomenal. It's one of the best DC things. It's a really, really good show. It does have this confusing moment in the final episode where they have the Ezra Miller flash and the, uh, the Aquaman, um, uh, Jason Momoa come in and like, now I'm like tied. And I guess they are still the Flash and Aquaman, but now it's tied, to, but they're in the Justice League. So it's like tied to that. And it's just like, well, which version of the Justice League are we doing? Because you've released two cuts of it and they're <laughs> really different. Um, so like, there's just all that, like the continuity is so fucked. I just, I don't know. And it's weird because you do have some people like grandfathered in like Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman and Jason Momoa as Aquaman. And I wouldn't want them to throw those out because they're great. And I'm excited for Aquaman 2 because I thought Aquaman 1 was big, dumb fun. But I don't know. It's all very confusing. Maybe just let it all be its own thing and don't think too hard about it. That's fine. Yeah, if you have to, like, you know, instead of releasing this Ezra Miller Flash movie, because they just kind of really shouldn't at this point, um, maybe just, like, release, like, a five-minute thing you put into theaters that just explains... It's like, and the multiverse shattered and all of our characters are in their own universe and never the twain shall meet again. The end. And just put that in theaters and like, that solves the whole thing. It's like, oh, crazy. Now there's just like, they're all their own thing. Wow. And and the Flash <laughs> died and was never heard of again. And also like, they're doing all these spinoffs of the Batman movie, the Matt Reeves movie. Like we're getting the Penguin uh-huh. show on HBO Max. They're doing some other stuff. And I'm fine with that. If you want to like, because a bat Batman is a rich world, and if you want to mm-hmm. do other things with it, that's totally fine. But like, it's a completely separate continuity, so you know it just gets confused. Just let them all be separate. It's okay. It really is. I don't know if anyone is all that jazzed about Marvel continuity these days. I don't meet any of the like Marvel fans who are super psyched about this stuff anymore. I think generally we're all very tired. Yes, and and I do for the love of God, I do not want. E- to like someone to make Matt Reeves put Henry Cavill Superman in to the Batman, you know, it's like, don't, don't fucking just don't do it. Just don't just please don't fuck that up by trying to say like, and then there's a big multiverse crossover and look, Robert Pattinson, Batman is in this too. Um, and then he takes Henry Cavill Superman back home and we make a best friends movie. It's like, just no, just, just stop. Please stop. <laughs> if I want to get that shit, I can read the comic books. But, Sean, I really want to see Henry Cavill and Robert Pattinson yelling about Martha. Okay, we're done talking about the segment. Do you want to talk about Halloween? Let's talk about Halloween. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I could play the actual song there as a transition, but I'm sure. just going to hum it. John Carpenter's Halloween from 1978 by some metrics, the most successful independent film of all time because it cost $700,000 and made like 70 million lifetime. Just an enormous, enormous hit that then spawned one of the weirdest franchises in movie history that is ongoing to this very month with Halloween Ends having come out a couple of weeks ago. Um, But we are here to talk about the original John Carpenter's Halloween, which I don't know about you, Sean. 
I, I actually do because I know you like it too. <laughs> it's one of my very favorite movies. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like it's in terms of like horror movies, my like holy grail horror movies are like this. It's Alien. It's like Twin Peaks, Fire, Walk with Me, and it's like Psycho. Maybe would be like my four off the top of my head that I would put into like this is the particularly for like American horror movies. If you want your crash course on like the best American horror movies, those are the four you should go for. Um, because yeah, I've seen this movie four or five times at this point. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just one of the best movies ever made full stop. Certainly one of the best horror movies. It is one of those like in a running for like most perfect movie, you know, particularly in terms of pacing. Um, this, this is a movie where on, on, uh, Wikipedia it has the runtime is 91 minutes, but that's because they rounded up because it's, it's like nine minutes and 50 seconds or something or 90 minutes and 50 seconds. It is like almost exactly 90 minutes long. Um, and it's just that like, it's a, the perfect example of like why 90 minutes is the exact length that almost all movies should be because like, <laughs> look at this fucking perfectly made little movie. Um, it's amazing. Um, I had a huge amount of fun watching it again last night. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think this is one of the best made films of all time. Like, mm -hmm. there are certain movies I think of as, like, film school in a box movies. Of, like, mm -hmm. movies where if you want to learn either how to make movies or how movies work. And I guess those things are interrelated. You know, if you want to learn how movies work because you want to go make movies. Or you want to learn how movies work so you can go write about them or think about them. Or just better understand the craft. There are... I don't know if there are any movies I would recommend above Halloween. There are others I would recommend on the same level. But it's in that class of like, mm -hmm. I, you know, this is one I point to. Raiders of the Lost Ark is one I point to. Psycho is a good one, obviously. But just like movies that like break down how these movies are built, how they think, how they move the camera, how they do sound design, how they are written and paced and acted. Halloween is a truly perfect movie. I can't put... There is nothing out of place in this movie. It is just immaculately made. And I am always in awe of the craft at it. And this time was especially crazy for me, Sean, because I did this stupid thing this month where I made myself watch all of the other Halloween movies, uh, including a lot of pretty bad Halloween movies. And I will admit, I was a little Halloweened out going into this last night. And I was wondering, did watching the one where Busta Rhymes electrocutes michael myers in the balls is that going to ruin my enjoyment a little bit of john carpenter's halloween tonight no i turned it on i have the nice uh, shout factory 4k blu-ray which is one of my favorite home video releases of all time and i put the movie on and i was completely engrossed from frame one to the end this movie even still makes me feel tense and scared in moments and i know mm -hmm. every beat of it um this is a film that I've wound up watching, I think, every single Halloween season here in this apartment or this condo that I have in Iowa City. Because for whatever reason, like, because uh, I did not see this movie as a kid um, or growing up, but I did, I found like the DVD in a bargain bin at like a Goodwill while I was shopping for new stuff for this place. And I watched it one Halloween to like get into it that time. And then I think I bought the old 4K release the next Halloween and watched that. And then the next Halloween, the Shout Factory version had come out. And I've watched that a couple times. So it's just become an, a, a ritual for me. And then I've gotten into some of the sequels and stuff. Um, but yeah, this is a... And I use this movie in teaching sometimes because it's just got a lot of scenes that like illustrate concepts really well. And yeah, it's a, it's a great, great movie. Yeah, and you know, it's particularly it's got you know it's got all your like psychosexual stuff. It's got all your voyeurism. <laughs> it's got like yep. masks and stuff in it. So it's got all the things you need for like film studies people to get all hot and bothered about it. So indeed, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, there's a great. It, I, I was ahead. listening to the uh, commentary track with John Carpenter and Jamie Lee Curtis last night, and there's a part where. Um, like I think someone's taking their shirt off and and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis like kind of nudges John Carpenter's like, so John, you know, all the academics say that this movie is all about how sex is bad and, you know, because Michael punishes the women who don't have sex, but you don't kill me because I don't have sex. Was that your intention? And John Carpenter just waits for a second and says, no, that was not my intention. And it's very <laughs> funny because you can tell how annoyed he is at all of that. Um, and I love it because John Carpenter is one of the smartest but also funniest people on the planet to me. Yeah, I mean, it is one of those things about this movie, though, is that, you know, it is it is not necessarily the first slasher movie, but it is certainly the movie that, like, 
popularized the slasher genre yes. and its major tropes, including the like so-called final girl and the dynamic of like the virgin girl is the one who survives and all that kind of stuff. But this movie, partially because it's it originates it, so it is like it's not copying tropes from something else as something like Friday the Thirteenth would do to this movie. Um, it is inventing those things, and so it is very thoughtful and considerate. And and the fact that uh, Lori survives is not just because she's virginal. There's a lot more going on there with her character and Michael's character and like sexual frustration and things like that that is much richer. And I think sometimes people pigeonhole Halloween because it has those tropes on the surface of it that those later movies do. But if you're just looking at them as tropes and not as what is this movie doing with this idea on its own outside of the context of the genre that it would effectively spawn? Um, this movie has so many rich ideas and themes um, and is so much more thoughtful about all those kinds of dynamics that would become very rote in later, both later Halloween movies, but later slasher horror movies in general. Um, and that's always the thing when you go back to this movie, you're like, oh, right, that's why this is a trope um, is because it's so well done here, but it's so hard to execute really well without it just falling into like rote moralism that almost, I, I mean, for me, no other horror movie I've ever seen has done those specific ideas as well as Halloween. No, not at all. I, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to say something controversial here. I prefer this movie to Psycho. I just think it's mm -hmm. a better and more interesting movie. Um, and like, you could come for me, Hitchcock bros, if you want, but like, uh, getting back to like what you were talking about, that is something that really struck me on this viewing, Sean. The character writing in this movie is very good and it's very mm -hmm. on point. And it's often done in such a way to intentionally feel mundane and everyday because I think so much of what makes this movie work is that it paints a very effective illusion of just sort of real everyday teenage life in small town Americana because the more and better you do that, the more Michael Myers feels like a transgression. But within mm -hmm. that, the character writing is very sharp. Every scene, I think, tells you multiple things about Lori in particular. I think she's a more complicated character every time I watch this movie. Um, she's a smarter character. You know, most final girls kind of get there by accident, and she does not. She's very smart in how she deals with the shape when that comes into being. The shape is also very smart in this movie and, like, conniving in a way that I think some of the Halloween sequels get very well and some of them don't get at all. But it's all just so beautifully executed. Obviously, we are, we're we big fans of this movie, I think, is the, is the yes. simple way to say it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's one of those, like, classic movies that it holds up to its reputation. Or it doesn't just hold up to its reputation. It, it like, exceeds its reputation because its reputation, I think, has been diluted somewhat over the years because of the like largesse of the like fucking ridiculous franchise that it spawned um the majority of which has very little honestly to do with this movie in most ways yes yeah i i think most of the halloween movies that follow i don't know if i would even put them in quite the same genre they're mostly all horror movies i guess but horror is such a baggy term it can mean so many things mm -hmm. i guess most of them are slasher movies but what slasher movies became after Halloween is frankly completely different than what Halloween is. So if you've got Halloween 4, which is much more inspired by like Friday the 13th, it doesn't feel a whole lot like Halloween 1. And I like Halloween 4 a lot, but I like it in a completely different way than I like Halloween 1. So that's also part of what's interesting. Yeah, I mean, only other than like the opening and stuff, in terms of like the main action of the movie, only three characters are killed. You know, and right. it's all like right around the same time at the end of the movie, at the beginning of the third act, Michael kills off the, the her like two friends and the guy. Um, right. And 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 all those deaths are by the standards of slasher movies, incredibly simple and they are not gory. There's in fact, there's almost too little gory in some ways in this movie. It's one of the places <laughs> where you can feel the budget. It's like the very like silly scratch quote unquote that Lori has that she gets from Michael. That is just like, here's a little bit of like red ink on your shoulder, but there's no like prosthetic to make it look like a wound or anything. It's just very basic. Um, so it, it doesn't, if you're looking for a movie that its main pleasure is derived from the like over the top, ridiculous, gory, extreme ways that, like 10 different characters are killed over the course of this movie, which is a lot of what slasher movies are. Halloween is not that at all. Um, you could go like an, a full hour basically without there being any like 
notable character deaths outside of the first three minutes of the movie. It's not a movie that has kills in that sense, yeah. right? Like, if you're talking about a Friday the 13th movie, or even a later Halloween movie, you're often thinking about, like, oh, what was the best kill in that movie? Because they're almost like stunts or something mm -hmm. like that. They're big events. There are no kills in that sense in this movie. Michael does it in a very almost utilitarian, simple way when he does it. He That's why he goes for the kitchen knife. He's not being... He's somewhat creative in how he gets people into the scenario to be killed. But then when the time comes, he just does it. Um, and it's very different than as you would say, like a, a traditional slasher movie or like 2000s torture porn, right? This is not mm -hmm. Saw. There's Michael is not putting a reverse bear trap on someone's head and playing a videotape and all of that good stuff. Yeah, like the most exotic thing he does is when he both strangles and stabs the guy, right? He like lifts yes. him, puts him in a chokehold, licks him up, and then he's like, you know what? I'm also going to grab my knife and stab you <laughs> rather than just strangle you. And then he stabs him so hard that he like pins him to the wall, which was a detail I'd forgotten. Is like, oh, right, yeah, Michael, even in this first movie, Michael Myers is like inhumanly powerful um, because he's, you know, he's meant to be, he's not just Michael Myers, he's the shape. That's a contender for the best shot of the movie, though. He, he yes. keeps him up there, steps back, and then admires his work, which mm -hmm. most of the Halloween sequels have a moment that try to emulate that because, like, it's an easy way to characterize him is to have him do the weird head tilts. But it's never better than in that scene where he's just, like, a boy admiring his finger painting. I just love it. It's so good. Yes. Yeah. So so let's get into the the me the movie because I want to let's like because I want to talk about the opening scene because it's one of the like most iconic opening scenes. Oh yeah in any horror movie um and it's one of those where it's like it's easy to forget that you know that the whole reveal of michael being a kid is a twist right at the very beginning because you're so you so already know that even the first time i watched the movie i already knew that whole right. element because the scene is very famous um but you know it's the whole big first person sequence um this is where you get your first like okay we're we're being voyeuristic um it's like get out your notebooks film student kids it's like write voyeurism yes. down and let's talk about it <laughs> um and you're literally looking through young michael's eyes that so you do not know that he's young necessarily at this point spying in on his older sister who is supposed to be taking care of him and instead of that she's playing around with her boyfriend or whatever right um they go upstairs they have sex off screen michael and that process like he slowly gets the kitchen knife all that kind of stuff he puts on the mask and covers the lens of the camera with the mask so you have the two eye holes he goes in and stabs his half naked sister to death goes outside takes the mask off and then it's, the camera pulls out and reveals oh you have been looking through the eyes of a child this whole time um but it's such a amazing opening scene for a few reasons one how it sets the tone of the movie of that it is the, the only moment that you are in Michael's head is at the very beginning. And it gives you like, you see the whole experience of him stalking and preparing a kill. What is his first kill from his POV? So that for the rest of the movie, when you are either generally in Lori's POV, not necessarily first person perspective, but generally like around her POV, seeing the things that she's seeing with her as a character, um, or sometimes you are voyeuristically with Michael, but from the outside, observing his being voyeuristic of his voyeurism to impress a theoretical film studies teacher and, and be fancy with it, right? <laughs> um, but you're you're always removed from him for the rest of the movie, either observing him or generally looking through Laurie's perspective. But because you open the movie seeing his process of killing and seeing what he does... In, an, in, a seam, un, in a seamless, unbroken sequence from a first-person perspective means you know exactly what Michael is and what he does and how he does it. And it gives you this framework, whether even you realize it or not, to understand the rest of the movie because the whole rest of the movie is him stalking Lori. Like, there's only a little tiny, like, five-minute sliver of Sam Loomis um, and, every, and, like, with, at the beginning where uh, Michael escapes. But, like, for the whole movie, it is Lori on Halloween Day and Halloween night, like, going throughout her day, and she, like, immediately sees Michael outside, you know, the um, her classroom and stuff. And it's like, you well, are it's, aware it's of it because the, whole the sequence. Yeah, the first thing Laurie does is take the key to the Myers house. Yes. That's, that's where right. Michael is waiting. He sees her, and then from that point on, he's after her. Um, and that's the connection that kind of sparks it. But, like, that's what he's doing. The, her and Tommy Doyle, because he goes after him a little bit, too, who's also there. Yes. Uh, at um, school and whatnot. Yeah, but that, that opening sequence is so genius, I think, in how it gives you this understanding of what's going to happen for the rest of the movie, but you are then ripped outside of that specific perspective, and so you are left 
vulnerable like Laurie trying to guess when and how and where he's going to appear and what it is that he's going to do because you are not in his head anymore. Yes, exactly. It is, uh, it is so virtuosic as an opening because it is done as a single take. There is one disguised edit and it's when he puts the mask on, mm -hmm. there is a cut there and it's fairly visible, but it's linguistically in the film language, it's unbroken um, because we don't move or cut through time or anything. So it's all real time, single take. It's a fluid, um, it looks a little handheld. It was a new rig at the time that they were using called Panaglide. John Carpenter was explaining in the, uh, actually, <laughs> John Carpenter didn't remember. Uh, it was Jamie Lee Curtis had to like remind some details in the commentary because um, she was there for all of this as well because mm -hmm. this was a tiny independent film production. That scene, the big single take, was the first thing they shot, or the last thing, I should say, the final thing they shot for the movie because the Myers house is a real house that they found that was kind of dilapidated. They shot all the exteriors with it. And then at the end, the cast and crew all came together to paint the house and redress it as a like normal, good looking house. And then there's so much complicated stuff going on. They were all working on it together because that shot, of course, if you have a long unbroken one -er like that, there's a million people running around behind the camera, moving mm -hmm. lights and moving things out of the camera person's way and all sorts of stuff. Um, and they pulled this off and it's a crazy thing to have pulled off for a tiny independent production. And this was truly independent. Um, but they did it and it is one of the best little pieces of filmmaking you'll ever see. And as you say, it puts us in Michael's, you know, point of view. It gets us thinking about looking and about stalking and about voyeurism. Uh, Michael never says a single word in the movie, but you do get some characterization and you get to think about what is going on in this kid's head and then, of course, he's an adult later on, but you still sort of see him as a child. There's so many interesting things happening here. Yeah, and it sets up all your general themes about, like, innocence, about, like, sex and, like, sexual frustration. You know, you have your, like, I guess it's not, like, Oedipal necessarily in, in the literal sense, but, you know, there's clearly some sort of sexual fascination with his sister that goes unfulfilled because she's both his sister and he is a child. Um and then he, you know, performs a symbolically sexual act by stabbing her over and over and over again, right? And like unleashes that. And so there is this, and that also that comes from him, like being seemingly like not being cared for, right? There's a lot of this movie about like adults or like pseudo adults, like teenagers caring for kids. And the main body of the movie is about babysitters, but in the opening, it's about this older sister, um, and the sense of like that that Michael is no pay, attention is being paid to him, right? There's this like brief line where the boy asks like, Hey, are we alone? And she says, Oh, I think Michael's off somewhere. I don't know. And she's very dismissive and doesn't seem to care that her like six year old kid on Halloween or six year old younger brother on Halloween night is just like mysteriously somewhere um, that she's supposed to be taking care of. Um, and so there's all those themes of like this need to be sort of like cared for as a child, not having been cared for of innocence, of loss of innocence, of like sexual frustration and inability to um, sort of act on those desires and feelings that then culminates in Michael becoming this monster that you get for the rest of the movie. I mean, adults are almost entirely absent from this movie yeah. other than Donald Pleasance as Loomis, who is a constant presence. It's mostly teenagers uh, and the teenagers are actually pretty readable as teenagers. Jamie mm -hmm. Lee Curtis was only 19. So it's not like ridiculous 30 year old teenagers uh -huh. in this movie, you know? Um, and so you have mostly teenagers and then little kids like Tommy and Lindsay, but adults other than Dr. Loomis kind of come in and out, but they're very around the fringes. There's also Sheriff Brackett who has a couple of scenes, but other than that, I don't think there's any other adult who like appears more than once. Like you only see Lori's dad once you only mm -hmm. see the parents of the kids once when they're like dropping the kids off if that it is about this world of like teenagers and children and it is about as you say you know caring for the kids and what their role is and one thing that i think people maybe miss in the final girl conversation here is Lori's the only person who actually like tries to get these kids to safety and like does responsible things with them um yeah. and that's a big part of her characterization as well yeah, and that for me, that's like kind of my my key reading of for like the final girl dynamic and why this movie does it very well and other movies don't is two things. It's like one, 
it is that like the reason why she can't in like a thematic sense she cannot be killed by michael is because she is the person that his sister should have been right she is caring for the kid she is trying to be responsible like she's trying to do the right thing and is very caring and nurturing and you have that contrast between her relationship with tommy and uh, the other girl i forget her name but her relationship with Lindsay. um and so you she gets she is that person that like that sister should have been for these kids but then also Lori's like Lori is like paired with Michael in some ways because they are the two characters that have the sexual frustration right so it's her it's not just that she's a virgin it's that like she wants to have some sort of sexual outlet but she doesn't and she doesn't know how to get it right and that's like part of that homecoming dance and she has this crush on this boy that's like a recurring subplot throughout the movie and so she is also com like committing the same act that Michael does um, with like, like precedingly more phallic objects of starting with like the needle, the like knitting needle, then the, like the changed coat hanger. And then with the kitchen knife that Michael has. So it's like, it's not just about her being virginal. It's about her being responsible, but then also her being sexually frustrated in the same way that Michael is. So it is more of a pairing between the characters and less of a like, they're on opposite sides or something. Yeah, I think that's something that is so easy to forget, but it's so clearly there. Like, a lot of Lori's dialogue in this movie is talking to her girlfriends about how she kind of wants a boyfriend. She would yeah. like to, like, you know, go off for one night and have sex. And she is has crushes on people. And she's very shy in a way that is, like, very endearing and relatable. But she is also horny in a way that mm -hmm. is, like, very relatable, right? And I think all of that makes her feel very human. And it is that she is, the responsibility is not like in opposition to that, you know? I don't think the implication is that like you can't be a babysitter and be sexual. It's just that like, I don't think it's, it's saying that at all. I think there these two things are at work in her at the same time. Um, this is something I actually, when I watched Halloween 4 last week, I was like, that's one of the only sequels that has a hero who I actually think gets some of these ideas down well, who is also like very caring for the kids in their life. And this is why they overcome Michael and whatnot. And it's a, it's a repeat of this one, but it's one of the only ones that gets it right. Because I think you're very right. The, the ways those characters are paired are much more complex than I think would become the trope in the genre to come. Yeah, because it's definitely like the problem with the other characters that are having sex is it's not that they're having sex, it's that they're like they're avoiding doing the thing, like they're avoiding being responsible, right? They're getting drunk, they're getting high, they're having sex when they're supposed to be taking care of these kids. It's like you can both be a babysitter and be a sexual person, but you probably shouldn't be doing both of those things at the same time. <laughs> um, and yes. that's that's I think like the issue that you get here. Um, and, and again, I just think there's something fascinating to me about the, the pairing of Lori and Michael in this movie in particular, in the way that they're two inability, to, both of them having this inability to sort of fulfill their sexual desires being the thing that can allow them to do these like violent acts to each other. Yeah. And that's something also that like, I think the original sin of Halloween as a franchise is the stupid piece of writing in Halloween 2 that frankly if you go back and watch Halloween 2 is surprisingly offhand and not important but is in there of that they retcon and make Michael and Laurie brother and sister right yeah and I think this continues in all the different variations of Halloween of trying to overcomplicate, but in overcomplicating, completely missing what's actually interesting of the relationship of Michael and Laurie like all the sequels having to come up with like, what is the reason we've paired these two characters? And John Carpenter gave plenty of thought to that in Halloween 1. And the reason is largely thematic. There is also a literal plot causality, which is that from the Myers house, she's the one who comes up and that's when he starts following her. And like, I don't, I never watch this movie and read it as like, he's waiting for her specifically. It's like, this is the girl he decides to pick up on. And then we go from there. So Halloween 1 needs no further explanation of that. But all of the later movies think, what is the, like... And eventually it gets very metaphysical with, like, the curse of thorn and shit, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a... Some, there's some years, there's a constellation in the sky that makes Michael have a desire to kill his blood, and therefore he blah, 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 blah. And it's all so stupid. 
And I, I don't even think the new movies by David Gordon Green, which reverse the retcon and have it be that they are not related, which is great. I'm glad they did that. But even then, by bringing them into closer proximity again, I don't think they always fully think about the reasons are more interesting because they are in between the lines. They're not mm -hmm. a literal familial connection or a literal plot connection. That doesn't need to be there to make this an interesting pairing. Yeah, it, it, like that whole dynamic exists entirely in a thematic space in the movie. Um, again, like there's no there's no moment where it's like Michael hesitates and that's why he's not able to kill Laurie because he sees the kids or something and identifies with it and has a flashback to his own youth and you get a revelation of, oh, and this is why Michael can't kill Laurie. Um, it is because uh, she is the caring one and the person that he wishes his sister was. Like, that would make the movie incredibly hokey. Instead, it's all exists in a thematic space. For thematic reasons, Michael is incapable of killing Laurie. And so, like, the only time he misses and he like you know he goes down with the knife and it grazes her instead of stabs her that happens purely for thematic reasons and and that is entirely appropriate for a movie it doesn't have to be strictly motivated by a clear like causality within the plot or causality within character motivations that can be something that is imposed upon the characters externally by thematic concerns that is entirely appropriate especially in horror yes uh, yeah as you say especially in horror you are in a space that is just like it's the most symbolic genre, right? Yeah. Like everything. I mean, it's a character in a mask. It doesn't get much more symbolic than that. Mm. And it's okay. He is he is the shape. That's my favorite fucking moniker in this whole series is that he's not Michael Myers. He is the shape. Just those kinds of things work so well. But yeah. But going off on talking about, you know, Laurie as a character, I do think it's something that this movie does incredibly well is the general just accumulation of detail and atmosphere in the first half hour, first hour of the kind of everyday mundanity and the simple mundanity. And you have characters who are concerned with, you know, dates and making popcorn and babysitting and getting their boyfriend over. And it just feels like such a complete real world very quickly right off the bat. I think Jamie Lee Curtis is a huge part of this mm -hmm. because her performance is just so good and so genuine. Um, but I think it, it touches everything. So that when Michael comes in, it feels like a true transgression. There's an actual invasion going on here. And I think that's something that most slasher movies in this series, in other series, just don't really get, is that you usually have much hokier, sillier characters. You frankly often have a lot of teenagers who we are supposed to hate because we're going to enjoy watching them get butchered. Mm -hmm. um, you have them go to a cabin in the lake where the, the transgression of Jason is like, very different because that's Jason's territory, not theirs, right? Um, and that's okay. That's what Friday the 13th does. Um, but I like that that, you know, this is more in almost the Nightmare on Elm Street vein where the Nightmare on Elm Street transgression is he's coming into your dreams, you know? But this is, he's coming into your life and Carpenter doesn't heighten it. He really makes it, you know, if Michael never came in, this would be an interesting little indie movie about Mm -hmm. a girl wanting to go on a date you know and it would be interesting in that vein as well and that's something i really like about this yeah it's one of the things about this movie that gives it it has like an extremely 70s feel to it um and i think part of it is yeah. like there's a real naturalism to the performances and to like the way it's shot and everything that is partially from its very small budget and it's like indie production um but it is also like part of the style of filmmaking of the 70s in america that this is like clearly like a part of and is part of like the thing that that carpet is coming out from you know because before this he made assault on precinct 13 where you can see a lot of similar ideas being tested there in a much more kind of night of the living dead riff kind of thing um but yeah it is it, you're absolutely right that is one of the things that is the beating heart of this movie is that it would be a perfectly entertaining little indie film about a girl growing up in a small town um feeling unfulfilled um, and all those kinds of things and just this little tiny character piece that's very personable and relatable um, in small scale and then Michael Myers interrupts that um, and and it and it perverts everything about the whole movie and the space that it exists in um, because one of the things I love about this movie is as it goes on and like Michael's invasion becomes more severe the more the whole like world of the movie becomes sinister and like unsettling um and and the way that suburbia in early in the movie has a sort of 
comfortable sort of feel to it and it feels like any sort of random high school movie watching these kids go through suburbia and you get to kind of follow them to the school and a little bit throughout town and so you get this sense of like this larger world everybody lives in and there's this one little creepy house and you know that that's where michael is um but then as the movie starts going and the world shrinks as halloween approach like halloween night approaches and it's about getting the kids and going into like everyone getting sheltered off to their own little houses and then the world of the movie sinks, sinks into this little like suburbia that is terrifying like the the little street that they live in in this movie is the most terrifying setting for me in any horror movie because of how like alienating and isolating it feels because of like what michael can do of that every you have all these little like murder boxes just waiting for him that whatever <laughs> happens in any of these houses you have no idea like the most you get is phone calls between them but this like sort of comfortable little small town neighborhood where it feels like very nice and fun and maybe everybody kind of knows everybody and you have your little like small like you know myths and urban legends and stuff about the myers house and all that all that kind of shrinks away into this almost kind of like nightmare space uh to the point where the scariest moment in the movie to me is when laurie runs out of the house goes to the after michael attacks her runs to the house next door screaming bloody murder being more or less literally knocking on the door for help the light goes on the guy looks through the blinds closes the blinds turns the lights off and that this whole space becomes so cold and uncaring and isolating um and that like magic trick of the movie is so effective to me and it is this thing where I have brought up this comparison before. This is something I, I heard from uh, Philippa Boyens, one of the writers on the Lord of the Rings trilogy, talking about writing those movies and saying, one. and I've brought this up a million times, but she uses this, she says, every scene has to achieve multiple things. Mm -hmm. That like, And this was, this was a goal. In, in that case, they were adapting a story. They were adapting J.R.R. Tolkien's books, but they were very you know, thoughtful about, we can't just have a scene here because we want to have a scene with Pippin that was in the book or whatever. Every scene has to be doing multiple things for the movie, you know? So like the prologue with Galadriel setting the scene, it can't just be exposition because if it's just exposition, that's boring and a bad way to give the audience information. So it also has to be atmospheric and it has to be like, you know, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And I think Halloween is a great example of that because every scene in this movie is doing a couple of different things for us. So in every movie, moment that you're establishing just the sort of everyday mundane but charming and relatable sort of reality of this world Laurie lives in you are also a set establishing things like a general visual language that we're going to be in long takes we're often going to be also in long shots with like full bodies in frame and we're going to have visuals that either it literally is Michael looking at her or it could be Michael looking at her because mm -hmm. the entire movie has this kind of voyeuristic quality. And so we're establishing that. Um, but we are also in, as you said, Sean, we see them go to school and back and they go down to the hardware store. We're establishing the geography of the entire neighborhood. And then when they start babysitting at night, when you start doing, you know, when you're saying that it starts to feel like claustrophobic and scary and all of that, that's because there's this series of events that are very like, precisely built to let you know the exact geographic and spatial relations of these two houses and everything within those two houses. So you have Annie uh, in her house with Lindsay moving around, making popcorn, getting on the phone. She goes out to do her laundry. She comes back. We see all of that space. And we're going to see that space because later on, big things are going to happen there. And when we know the geography, all of that becomes more readable and I think it becomes scarier. Mm -hmm. So... The moment that does it for me is right after the moment you were talking about where Lori is screaming bloody Murray murder and the guy doesn't let her in. Then she comes over back to her house or back to Tommy's house and she's yelling for Tommy to let her come in. And we keep cutting to the shape, just getting closer and closer and closer. And part of why it's so effective is that John Carpenter doesn't need to do anything to tell us the geography because he's done a really good job instilling in us the exact spatial relationships between this house and that house and the distance between them. And it's not even that Michael is watching, walking unnaturally slowly. He's just covering the distance and we know the distance. And it feels very real and very scary because of that. You know, I think a, a, a basic rule Carpenter follows in this movie is that nothing important happens in a space until unimportant things have happened in that space. And mm -hmm. we know that space. Like, 
Annie doesn't get killed in that car in that garage until we've been out to the laundry and we've been out in these different places of the house. You know, we don't have Lori, you know, having the shape attack her from over the couch until we've had them all watching a horror movie on the couch and eating popcorn. And that's also what makes it feel transgressive. And all of this is just, this is what I mean when I say this is just meat and potatoes filmmaking at its absolute best. Yes, because it is, it is absolutely, you're one of the, right, that it is the one of the most effective movies you can see for establishing the geography and the spatial relationships of everything happening in that movie and then weaponizing that in so many different ways across the film. Because, you know, you've got... Um, because really, because this movie is like, right, it's like in more or less into three thirds where you have following more or less the 90 minutes of it, where you have the first section, which is establishing everything. It's the, we're in the town. Here's like who our characters are. Michael's coming in, all that stuff. The middle 30 minutes is all about the slow building of tension. Okay. Now we have the babysitters in their two houses. Michael is stalking them. What is going to happen here? And then you have the last 30 minutes, which is the killing start. Lori has to go. She gets attacked by Michael. All that stuff has to happen. Um, and so you've got sort of in that middle section, you've got one of the only sequences that in the whole last hour of this movie um, where you are not really in or in the exact location of those two houses where you're crossing between them, which is Lindsay going across, right? And then going over to the house that Lori is in. And then in the last section of the movie, building up to her seeing Michael is one of the other best scenes in this movie is Lori crossing the street to go to that house is one of the scariest things in any fucking horror movie. And it's just her walking across the street. And you know that she's not going to be attacked in the street. You know that like, you know, it's not until she gets to the house. But how fucking terrifying and faceless that house becomes when it used to be this like very warm, affectionate place um, and you're like, oh, you know that this is where all this goofy shit is happening with the popcorn and this little girl on the couch. She's just like totally zonked out looking at watching the thing from another world <laughs> and all this stuff happening. Um, and now it is this thing where it's like, what what is going on in there? And the way of like lights turning on and off and not knowing like, what does this mean? Calling and like being able to kind of almost vaguely hear in the distance that that phone is ringing in that house and nobody is picking it up and her having to walk step by step across to go to that house. And then obviously then it is reversed later when she has to try to go back, get, get back into the house that she came from. But that geographic relationship between everything and the way it becomes perverted um, is it's just one of the best things about this movie. And one of the most remarkable pieces of filmmaking about it is that it is not just very good at establishing the geographic spaces. It is using that geographic space as a weapon against the audience. I mean, the scene where it's her crossing the street, but then she gets in that house and she explores that whole house in the mm -hmm. dark. And we know that house really well because we've been there with Annie and Lindsay. And then we've been there with Bob and uh, Linda, who are the couple who go have sex there. And so we've already had multiple sets of people in that space. And now that space is empty. And we know all the places Michael could kill her, right? Yes. Like, because we also, by the time Lori goes out and becomes active, we know Michael's M.O. really well. Part mm. of why we know he, she's not going to die in the street is he doesn't do that. He's not going to come out at her in the middle of the street. He has all his games he's playing, frankly, right? But once she's in the house, she's in his zone. And now it's like, well, what it's going to be? And the payoff to that scene is phenomenal. Because what Michael has done, because one of my favorite details about Michael Myers is that he is a practical joker, is he has made her the greatest haunted house of all time. Yes. He has made her a very real haunted house, and she gets up to the room, and there's the dead body, and there's the tombstone. <laughs> There's the pumpkin. I love the image in my head of Michael Myers walking that jack-o'-lantern in there and carefully arranging all of it. It's hilarious. Um, but yeah, just before you even get to the horror you know, payoff of it all, just the very idea of walking around that house and we know all the places Michael could be, uh, it's phenomenal. It's such good, again, it's meat and potatoes. This is one of the things that amazes me about this movie is it's not just that it is independent and it was made on a budget, it doesn't need to have money. Nothing this movie does in terms of scaring you or thrilling you or anything requires any special effects. It doesn't require particularly like expensive equipment. You need good you know, camera equipment for some of the like long movements they're doing and stuff. But mostly it's just if you have a camera and you have skill and you have good actors, you can do this. This is not reliant on money or effects or flash at all and that's part of what's so impressive about it 
Yeah, because also, you know, partially because it is such a low budget movie, all the location, like all of it is just shooting on locations. Like these are real yeah. houses, you know, um, they, they didn't build like a, a set that is this. Here's this house set. Um, and that's part of the thing of that helps make all the thing, the the world of the movie feel very real and very lived in is because it is very, very real. Um, even by the standards of movies well before like or cg effects and that kind of stuff where we're used to green screen now but even for like the era everything is so real because they're just that's you have to you have to leverage as much like existing stuff as you possibly can you can't make a lot of custom stuff you know all of these are just like the actors are just wearing like eh, this is these are like my clothes or i went to the fucking like jc penny and i bought a pair of jeans you know like that's like very much the the, the like sort of mode of the movie and it, and it works to the movie's advantage 100 percent I this is so funny. Jamie Lee Curtis on the commentary says the clothes I'm wearing at the beginning of this movie, my outfit. I went to J.C. Penney and bought it for the movie, and my hair, literally J.C. Penney, and you know her hair is sort of frizzy because she had had a perm for a different project, and then they thought, okay, Lori's not going to have that, so we'll flatten it out. But when you do that, it becomes kind of frizzy. But hey, that actually kind of works for the character, so we'll just leave it. It's just you know it is kind of your independent production where. You know, the actor is making a lot of those decisions for themselves because there isn't the budget for a giant costume department, you know? Yeah. You, know, and you don't I mean, need it. Yeah, because this is where you get, you know, like, I think one of the most well known details of this movie is that, you know, the Michael Myers mask is a Captain Kirk mask that has been, yes. like, fucked with and painted and stuff. Um, and it is that thing where this movie is a great example of where those kinds of sort of constrictions on filmmaking or on any kind of creative project can be one of the things that gives it like it's that, that kind of magic that special touch um because these like very talented creative people have to push against these very like intense restrictions and so you know the the michael myers mask being this kind of shitty mask that is painted white is part of like the appeal of it it's part of like the effect of it is that like if you had this perfect you know super expensive where you just got like one of the greatest prosthetic makers in hollywood to make the best mask possible i don't think it would work as well as this sort of loose fitting awkward looking weird gangly white mask that has just been like sort of roughly painted over um is part of the the like the grunginess of everything about the look of that character and what's so funny to me is the the I think until you get to the modern Halloween films, the Rob Zombie remakes and then the David Gordon Green sequels, those both do the mask really well. All the other Halloween sequels, the mask looks like shit. Yes. They way overthought it or they, in some cases, it looks like shit in a funny way. In Halloween 4, it doesn't look like Shatner. It looks like Michael Jackson and it makes it extremely <laughs> funny because he looks like he's it's Michael Jackson walking around coming after you. Um but yeah, it, in the, all the other ones, they just got it so wrong. And I mean, the way they did this is uh, Tommy Lee Wallace, who was the editor on this movie, and then also did production design and art direction and all sorts of stuff because uh -huh. it was a small, you know, friend affair. And Tommy Lee Wallace later directed Halloween 3, which is a great movie if you've never seen it. Um, but Wallace bought the mask. It was a Captain Kurt mask. He bought it for $1.98 from a costume shop on Hollywood Boulevard. And then he widened the eye holes and spray painted it white. And that's what they had. And it's just like, it's just fucking genius. Mm -hmm. It's fucking genius. And it works so well. It reads so well. And it's just hilarious to me that like one of the most famous images in movie history, certainly horror movie history, is a fucking Captain Kirk mask. Because, you know, that's ingenuity. That's just good filmmaking is to kind of take what you have and make something with it. Yeah, and that like the concept of the mask is a thing that's really important of having this sort of featureless right. pale white mask that is that thing that, you know, it, it is kind of a thing that to me, it reflects a little bit of what this movie does to the houses in like the suburbia element of that there's this thing that is hidden there and you cannot see it, you know, then you cannot see what is going on in this little box. You cannot see what is going on over that street. You don't know what's happening and you're isolated. And it's the same thing with his mask that you cannot see what's going on behind that. It is recognizably human-esque, um, but it is, it is you know, a perfect example of the uncanny, you know, in that very Freudian sense of that it, it approaches the human, but it is so fundamentally off from it that, it is, that you can't read anything off of it. Yeah, I love it. And I, you know, 
it I also do kind of love all the terrible versions we get later because they're mm-hmm. funny, um, but nothing nothing kind of beats the original and just the way it is shot and God, there is that shot that is it's obviously it's extremely iconic. They recreate yeah. it in Halloween Ends where Lori is sort of crying and she's alone in the house and there's just the big black kind of wall behind her. And then his face, the white face, just slowly emerges from it. I'm not even sure how they did it on like an mm-hmm. exposure level. It's such a good shot. But it is terrifying and it is iconic because it is the white uncanny face just coming into view. You, you're not even sure what moment you start to see it. It just comes out, you know? Yes, yeah. That is easily the most iconic shot in Halloween. This thing that like all the yeah. all the Halloween movies try to do something that like sort of replicates a little bit of that right. shot. It's the, the one that like, you know it's impossible to not have seen that shot because it is in any Halloween movie sizzle reel, you know, or certainly, you know, maybe nowadays people are so isolated from that kind of like TV marketing stuff, but back in the day and then you're like, Oh, we're doing like our Halloween movie marathon. That shot is going to be in some promo, you know? Um, but yes, it is like, no matter how many times you have seen it, it is, it is one of the best shots in the history of horror movies. It is so perfectly framed that how, deep that blackness is of that room and then him just as you say it is because it's a very as i thought like every shot in this movie it's very very long and it's just this very slow gradual emergence and as you say you don't even really know when you first notice that he's standing there it's it has a little bit of a magic trick effect to it because the like it is such a gradual reveal that you that it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment it's almost like when you start up a new video game and it asks you to do your brightness settings and it's like, you know, yes. move this slider until you can't see the video game logo. And you're like, can I see it? Can I not? Is there, is that there? It's this like, it feels like you could do, if they made a big budget Halloween game, that absolutely should be what they do for that. Like HDR it's just calibration this shot screen. from the movie. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> can you move see the Michael's slider. Face? Yeah. Move the slider until you terrify Laurie Strode. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, you could make a pretty good Halloween move a game. I think it would just possibly be extremely distasteful depending on how you make it. Um it's true. because if you make it as Michael, then it's basically Hitman if you're just a murderer and it's not like there's no pretense of you're killing bad guys. Yeah, you're just murdering teenagers. Yeah. Which, you know, that that could be cathartic in its own way. <laughs> That's a good point. You know, that yeah. is a good point. <laughs> but no, I and I love the you know, talking about the independent nature of it, there's so many fun behind the scenes details, and I think it comes through in the movie um, of the ingenuity that does come from these things. Like Jamie Lee Curtis talks in the commentary about part of the reason why the movie is shot all in long takes isn't just because it's an obvious artistic choice to like increase tension and there's the voyeurism aspect. It's also because they only had Donald Pleasance for like three or four days. He was a major mm-hmm. actor. He's the big, like, he's the person who brings gravitas to the movie, yeah. right? There is, he is very clearly the first name that shows up on those credits, you know? Yes, it's it's uh, Donald Pleasance in John yeah. Carpenter's Halloween, right? And so they only had him for a couple of days. And so if you only have him for a couple of days, then when you have like the scene where he is at Smith's Grove and he's talking to the guy and he's like, you let him out. You should never have let him out, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes and gets in the car and goes away. That's all one take. It's a wonder. Um, and they and part of why they do it that way is because we only have Donald Pleasance for a couple of days. Let's do it once so we don't have to do multiple setups. Um, and yet you would think it's completely a creative choice because it just plays like that language of the movie is so much better than if you were able to do shot reverse shot and do a lot of cuts and whatnot. Like, I think it works so well because of that, but there's also these production conditions on top of it. Um, and it's just a fun, you know, fact of these things. I think all the stuff, so, so I, I'm looking at this again and yeah, the, the, I was right. It's a, called a panaglide is the system they used for a lot of the filming where the camera is moving. And it's basically a, a clone of the steady cam, which mm-hmm. was coming into existence at this time. The Steadicam would be popularized in The Shining by Stanley Kubrick, which comes out two years later. I've always kind of wondered if Kubrick was a little inspired by this movie because there's just like, Kubrick uses it differently, but there are some similarities, I think, in how they employ long takes, moving cameras. It's a very different sense of space because Halloween is widescreen and Shining is just standard 4.3. Um, but overall, like it's it, both of those do that very well in a way that makes the long take and basically long tracking shots very scary. Yeah, and it's one of the things that's very effective with this movie is that you do, 
you know, it doesn't, because it isn't, it doesn't it can feel like, you know, a handheld camera or anything. It doesn't have like that level of shakiness, but it's also not like perfect. You know, the right. movement of the camera isn't like exactly perfect, like a really high budget Hollywood movie would usually have. Um, and so it's, it's in this nice middle space where it feels lively. Like it, it makes you feel like you're the cameraman in a lot of shots while not exactly being just sort of like what you would later, like a really extreme version would be like the Blair Witch Project or something. Um, obviously much later. Uh, but it's it's part of like the unique visual aesthetic of this movie I've always really loved is it's in this, there's just no other movie that quite the camera moves and feels exactly that way. And it's probably because it is using that technology fairly early for this, in this like weird kind of guerrilla production. Um, but there are like just some really amazing long takes that they get that they have like great setup of like one of my favorites is early in the movie you have the the kid getting bullied at the school and the bullies run away and michael grabs him and then he starts slowly like following the kid and watching him through the fence and gets in the car and drives and then like drives slowly past the kid and slows down it's like such a great sequence and and again it, it just moves so perfectly and it feels like you know, it's like it takes a lot of talent from that crew to be able to do those kinds of setups. Like, yes, it's cheaper in that you don't have to like reset things up and refilm it and shot this, shoot this other angle and stuff. But it must have taken so much work to try to prepare and execute and get everybody coordinated to do some of those shots and sequences. Oh, absolutely. There's it's actually very funny when you hear Carpenter on the commentary because Jamie Lee Curtis will be like this is an amazing shot and Carpenter will be like yeah I have no idea how we did this like <laughs> it's just like he's like marveling at it and I think part of that is that if you were a more experienced filmmaker I don't think you would try some of those shots yes. you'd be like scared off at the technical complexity of it and you know Carpenter had some experience here obviously but he wasn't like you know a 30 year filmmaking veteran yeah this is his might... third movie you know like right and, and again and all of his other movies are smaller budget than this one Yes. And of course, the, the Panaglide stuff is a new technology. But like, yeah, you have shots that are like getting in and out of a car and moving around. And like, you have a lot of actors, including little kids who have to hit marks. Yes. And like, if you fail, you have to reset. Uh, I think a lot of like, I think, and like, understandably so, if you were more experienced, you might go, well, let's break this up because this seems crazy. But they don't break it up, and so it's phenomenal. And it's just like, you kind of technically marvel at it. But that's what I mean by, like, it's just pure skill. They're not working on, like, oh, we had all this fancy tech helping us out. The best they have is this Panaglide, which is kind of an imperfect steady cam. The steady cam in The Shining, what makes it so eerie is it's so steady. Like, yes. it's like a, it's ghostly. It feels like it's floating. And I like that it's a little uneven in this because Michael Myers isn't a ghost. He's a person who walks and moves and has weight. And so when it has a little bit of that, that just makes it all the more tactile and embodied. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that, that perspective of it being like, because they're, you know, not amateur amateur, but relatively inexperienced filmmakers that that is part of what gives this movie this energy because it definitely it has that kind of Citizen Kane effect right like that's what Orson Welles yes. always talked about in interviews about Citizen Kane when they would people would ask him about oh why did you think to do the deep focus or the low angle shots and building the sets and like all the things that that movie helped innovate on he's like I don't fucking know <laughs> it's like <laughs> I, had no, I, I didn't make any movies before um you know and then Greg Toland was a great cameraman and he was like hey man you just do it and I'll fucking figure it out and I'll do I'll do whatever you need me to do um, so he had like a great caravan and there was just like, yeah, fuck it. Like, let's do this shot. And they tried it and they did it. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very much like that, you know, it's, it, it's this movie. It feels like this kind of thing that a more experienced filmmaker would be. I think the word, I think from the Orson Welles interview I'm thinking of is the timid, right? That you'd be more timid than to try to ex like experiment and go this far with some of these very elaborate setups where like, I, I'm glad that John Carpenter in that director's commentary says, like, I'm not sure I got the shots. Because some of the shots I look at, I'm like, how the fuck did they do this? Like, how did they get this kid to hit this mark and get this camera in this car and move it here and, like, have all of that work so perfectly? Like, how the fuck did some of these shots work? Because they're not complicated in the sense that they look impossible to do in, the, like, that there's something unreal happening in them. They're just complicated in the sense that it's, like, from a pure coordination perspective, this seems really fucking hard to get down 
it impresses me more than something like, you know, today you have a lot of these constructed oneers that are incredibly impressive and take mm-hmm. a lot of artistry, like Birdman or the beginning of Gravity or something like that. And I admire and respect these hugely. But those movies also have resources that dwarf, in, you know, their catering budgets dwarf what they were working with on Halloween. And so I look at Halloween and I just see like, Again, it's just there's nothing else helping them other than their own skill, and I find that so interesting. And the Citizen Kane connection is a good one because the thing that makes Citizen Kane so special is that in spirit, it's an independent movie. Yes. It happened to be made at a big studio with a bunch of money behind it, but like as a fucking accident almost because they didn't know what they were getting in Orson Welles, right? And instead they get Orson Welles, who I think should be understood as like the father of American independent cinema, really, mm-hmm. in that, you know, that's the spirit he brought to everything. Um, and Halloween is independent and this is what you know can be great about independent movies is that sense of you're not working off of anything right you, yeah you are inventing yeah and you get some of like these just incredible shots throughout the whole movie um, it has some of my favorite shots like there's one very early on where Laurie is walking down that very very long sidewalk and then Michael slowly steps into the right third of the frame and you just hold there with him standing there breathing in the right hand of the frame you're kind of slightly over his shoulder walking watching Lori walk away and it feels like you're watching that for minutes it's probably not on that long but you're just sitting there staring at the sequence um and it's so beautifully composed and so well framed while also feeling incredibly deeply sinister it's one of the most voyeuristic feeling shots of the movie in some ways um because it doesn't start voyeuristic and it becomes voyeuristic by Michael entering the shot and it changes the whole context of the framing. Yeah. There's also just because it is shot on location relatively quickly, you sometimes just get these beautiful images that come out of nowhere. Like um, I love all the stuff when they're driving and I love just Mm -hmm. seeing the neighborhood, but there's this one shot where the camera, it's completely different from anything else in the movie, but the camera is put in the back seat looking up at Annie while she's driving and the sun just breaks in Mm -hmm. like in a video game, we would call them God rays. Um, in HDR on 4K, this is an especially gorgeous shot. And I'm like, God, that's just a beautiful image. And you, you just get some of those, particularly in the first like third of this movie. I think you get darkly beautiful images later on, but they're, again, dark uh, for various reasons, both because of lighting and because of the murder going on within them. Yes. Um, so, you know, like like I would also, I would say like the stuff, like the reveal of Michael's haunted house, you know, at the end is a beautiful shot, but it's very dark. It's very yes, darkly beautiful. very dark. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, but I love all of that. And this is, I just have to say, one of my favorite 4K movies, the the Shout Factory, Scream, it's Shout Factory, but when it's horror, they call it Scream Factory, which I've always mm-hmm. thought is funny. Their release of this is one of my absolute favorite 4K discs. It looks so beautiful. This movie has such amazing texture and color. The oranges on the pumpkins are such a great HDR. The opening titles, which is one of my favorite opening title sequences ever, of the big orange font yeah. with the pumpkin, zooming into the pumpkin, uh, that is a genuine HDR showcase if you've never seen it. Yeah, I wanted to get the 4K HDR for this podcast, but the but I couldn't get it in time, so I had to just get a streaming version. It's still it's still en route to my house. So yeah, and and again, this is the kind of movie that I think would look good if you're watching on tape, you know. But like mm-hmm. it, in any form, but that is a it is a really really good set. Um, absolutely. One part and of this speaking, movie oh, I do want to talk about also. Uh, is we got to talk a little bit about Donald Pleasance and Dr. Sam Loomis. Oh, absolutely we do. There's some good shit. He has the best fucking dialogue. This is the thing I know about this movie is that um, uh, uh, John Carpenter's girlfriend at the time, Deborah Hill, was that her name? That she worked and on. The... She's the producer and yes. she co-wrote the movie. And yeah. yeah, and she worked with John Carpenter on a bunch of stuff. But she, yeah, so she wrote the dialogue, generally speaking, for the girls, which makes sense. Having been a teenage girl, and it's one of the things that I think gives the teenage girl dialogue like a lot of verisimilitude but john carpenter wrote the sam loomis dialogue and you can really fucking tell because (laughs) donald pleasance just gets some dialogue that's like so heavy and he has this one i just want to read this this is what this big speech he gives to the sheriff bracket that is like so poetic and it's so different and there's something that i love that that loomis is just from like a different world he's this like van helsing motherfucker that has come into this movie and it's the best shit but he has this speech where he says I watched him for 15 years, sitting in a room, staring at a wall, not seeing the wall, looking past the wall, looking at this night, inhumanly patient, waiting for some secret, silent alarm to trigger him off. 
Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. Now you can either ignore it, or you can help me to stop him. And every time I get that speech, I want to just, like, stand up and start clapping. This like, fuck, fuck yeah. Like, it's one of the genius things of the pacing of this movie is Dr. Loomis in, like, I have to mention this was an intentional choice, is a, you know, a a spot of light on this movie, right? In Latin, Lumen, Loomis. Um, but he is, like, this... Every time you get a cut to him, you get to feel just a little bit safer because he's the only guy who knows what's happening. He's the only guy who's taking it seriously. And he's taking it very, very, <laughs> very seriously. Like, this isn't just, like, some dude who got out who's a little dangerous. This isn't even, like, a fucking serial killer. This guy is is death itself. Evil incarnate has broken out of my mental hospital and he has come to your town and I have a fucking gun and I'm like 100% sure this gun's not even going to stop him, but we got to do something. Um, you know, like the level of like, oh yeah, I definitely knew this was going to happen. He has when they visit the grave where his sister is and he sees the tombstone isn't there and he's not surprised or shook by it. He's like, yep, Michael's been here. It's like, yep, I, I fucking knew some shit would be down here. Like every scene he's in is like it's a little bit goofy but in a way that like works so well for the movie because it gives you this slight bit of levity before you move back in to how heavy the rest of the film is it's achieving several different things you know on the one level it is such a it's a very clear nod i think to universal horror and to dracula yes. and to van mm -hmm. helsing but it is we're gonna do a van helsing character but we're gonna just dial it up a couple notches mm -hmm. right like it's extra ridiculous there's a moment when i think it's 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 the scene where michael gets the car and like steals the car and all of that and you have loomis like running around and in the background of a show he goes the evil has escaped and yes. like no one else could sell that line but the fact that you get this you know very respected character actor donald pleasance who before this would have been famous for stuff like the great escape he was in a james bond film lots of different things a very revered actor uh it's particularly a stage actor um but you get him yelling the evil has escaped and then you have all of his speeches and everything you're talking about. I think there's like, there's a bit of a twinkle in his eye. And there's just a bit of like, Loomis is a little off his rocker too. Um, but he's also right. And all of that yeah. just makes it so fun. As you say, you feel a little safer when he's around because at least he's trying. At least he gets it. And, you know, I love that moment where they are in the Myers house and that thing falls and like breaks the window and he pulls out the gun. And then he looks very sheepishly over at the sheriff and he's like, I do have a permit for this. And he pulls out the yes. permit. He's like, you must think me a terrible doctor. Um, but I love that. Of course, you know, he came, he came packing. And that is a thing. I love in all the Halloween sequels, even when they get bad, if Donald Pleasance is there, it can only get so bad because he's wonderful. And he keeps carrying around that pistol mm -hmm. until the end of Halloween 6, until he's out of the franchise. And he, at a certain point, goddamn well knows it will do nothing, but it's all he's got. So he's going to yes. keep that pistol. And I'm going to read the other big speech that Dr. Loomis has because he has the two. And I found the other one here um, where he says, I met him 15 years ago. I was told there was nothing left, no reason, no conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of good or evil, right or wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. I love it. I love it so much. There's like, there's a little bit of, you say, as there's a bit of madness to him. There's a little sadness, I think, he inflects mm -hmm. into all of this. Like, he's a doctor. He would have loved to have helped heal Michael Myers, but he can't. And so he's going the other way with this, you know? Um, it's it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just, it's fucking amazing. This, every, every scene he's in, just, again, it, it kind of brightens the movie up a little bit. You know, you've got the great, you know, ending where Laurie says, like, it's it was the boogeyman. It was the boogeyman. He says, like, as a matter of fact, it was. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's one of my favorite movie endings ever. Yeah. I've, I've often thought of this. I have a little list running. One day I will finally write this up of my favorite movie endings. But Halloween is a perennial entry on that list. Mm -hmm. And it is the, the, you know, he shoots Michael. Michael falls out the window off the balcony. And then Laurie says, it was the boogeyman, wasn't it? And he turns and says, as a matter of fact, it was. And then he walks out and looks down and Michael's gone. And then we cue the music. 
we have all those cuts around the house to the various mundane spaces that are now scary to us because yeah. of Michael. And then the final shot of the Myers house and then cut to black. Perfect. End. There's never been a more perfect ending. Yeah. It's just phenomenal. And they put the breathing right over all the yes. shots. So, because you have that effect throughout the movie, that sound effect of Michael's heavy breathing whenever you're sort of adjacent to his um, POV and stuff. And now it's just this like unsettling, you know, because these these are not this kind of realistic grounded camera where it feels like you're almost like a cameraman, like in the action with the characters. These are like stock looking shots from like above looking in like these kind of perfectly framed shots of these rooms that are very kind of omniscient in their perspective. And now they have the Michael breathing on them where you have no idea like where he is, like in what corner is he hiding? What is he? you know um the movie and yeah and then the movie just cuts uh it's one of those things that you know lots of more modern movies are very bad at ending because they just like to keep going and going and going like a more modern version of halloween and some of like the other halloween movies do some of this kind of stuff would have to have like oh here's a scene that like resolves that like the you know the police sheriff in this movie never finds out that his daughter dies well we need to have a scene where he finds that out it feels weird that that's hanging oh we need to have a scene we have well we have the homecoming thing with Lori that that never got resolved in her date with that boy we need to like have the last scene be her at like the homecoming dance alone and distraught or whatever because her friends are dead and there's like arguable reasons to have some like epilogue like scenes there are little pieces of plot that that could in like character stuff that that could kind of shave off and resolve but this movie knows like now nah, you don't need any of that shit like you 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 shot the monster you think the monster is dead the monster is not dead he is out there somewhere cut to black you were we are never safe like and that's it and that's the movie and that's like the note it ends on and it's just such a powerful mic drop of an ending and it's also amazing if you hear John Carpenter talk about Halloween in literally any venue, that audio commentary, in an interview he's ever given, he will go to great lengths to stress over and over how he never wanted there to be a sequel. Mm -hmm. And like, I think he's fine with there being a, a franchise. He's made lots of money on it. And he's very open about that. And I love it. Um, but like he did clearly, this was a one and done. This is like yes. the, the most obvious one and done ever. This There was never any intention for more. This is what they wanted to make. They made it. Um, you know, and it's, it's as, it's just a perfect ending. Um, talking about the breathing over it. This is something that always surprises me when you go back to this one is that Michael is very vocal in this movie. He's mm -hmm. not verbal. He doesn't say words, but he's not silent. Most of the Halloween sequels have Michael as completely silent. And that is different because in this movie, he's breathing is heavy. And when he gets into action, he does a lot of grunting, like, I feel like there's a lot of, like, you know, the Frankenstein monster in him in some mm -hmm. of the just, like, big kind of guttural grunts he does. Like, some kind of... It, it could be Frankenstein, it could be something else, but just, like... And, I mean, there's literally shots where they recreate images of famous movie monsters, like when he carries out Annie's body. Yes. Um, obviously, big movie monster image. But they do that a couple times where he is, you know, again, less of a ghost or a specter than, I think, a movie monster in that sense. And the grunting and the breathing helps with all of that, in addition to being there for, I think, the voyeuristic and sexual side of it, too. Yeah, well, because I think it's one of the great things about him as a monster in this movie is that there's this, like question you know not a question that like means like oh we can find the answer if we put the hints together just like an open sort of like mystery and an uncertainty in this movie of like how much of michael is just a guy and how much of him is something more than that like is he as loomis insists evil incarnate or is he just like this like you know kind of psychotic kid who never really grew up um who, who grew up physically but never grew up mentally and psychologically like does he really even understand that he's killing people i think is kind of an open question in this movie like does he understand at all that he's doing something that people would consider wrong um or is he playing and just having fun there's something so childlike about him you know you have this very odd scene where um he kills the guy and then the girl is like in the bed right that after they've had sex and she's still there and then he comes in wearing the sheet like a classic goofy halloween ghost with the guy's glasses over the top of the sheet to like help create the illusion that it is just like her boyfriend there um and just stands there and waits 
Um, and it's like, arguably, he is maybe doing that because he is trying to set off the series of events that causes Lori to come over. And maybe he's doing that intentionally. And that's why he's being sort of odd and excessively patient and slow about that death. Or maybe he's having fun pranking and doesn't really have any understanding of what he's doing. And then you don't get any access to that. Like, the only thing you have is this notion that, well, he the first time he killed someone was when he was six years old. And so you have this image of him being childlike and being innocent and that being distorted in some way. How much of that has changed now that he is an actual adult and is, like, almost inhumanly powerful? Um, it's one of the, just the, the great elements of this movie is that there is this central, unsolvable mystery that you are constantly kind of exploring at the heart of this monster. I love it. I, I love that there's kind of multiple interpretations for it all. Because on the one hand, you can read his actions as very smart and very conniving in the way that he is manipulating scenarios to get people where he wants so that he can dispose of them in a in a certain kind of almost economic fashion and then and eventually to get to Lori, which he does, right? I mean, he very, it does, the sequence of events does work to mm -hmm. lure Lori out. But then there is also the sense of it's play, you know? It is when he, we talked about earlier, one of my favorite images where he stabs Bob, pins him up off of his feet on the, you know, cabinet, and then just kind of looks at it. And again, it it's very childlike. In other Halloween movies, when they recreate this moment, they make it sinister. I think Carpenter plays it as like a kid looking at, you know, artwork or something. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very like, oh, what have I done here? And then, yeah, he puts on the... You fucking you have to again you have to imagine these things in your head of the shape finding a bed sheet cutting out eye holes taking bob's big dumb coke bottle glasses and putting them on and then going and doing this well is this him being conniving as you were saying sean is it him being playful and pranking is it him being cruel is it him having this psychosexual fantasy of now he's going to take the role of the boyfriend and fuck her like what is this there's there's many ways to read it and michael both invites and refuses all of them. And that's what's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and it's just, it's it's a thing where he's not just a monster, right? It's, there's there's more to him than that. It's, he's not just a sort of like weapon to be used to kill other characters in the movie. Um, and he's also not, you know, he's not like cracking wise or, or whatever, like a Freddy in Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, there is just something sort of alien and bizarre about him, but you're given just enough hints and things with that prologue to read what you need to read into him to create these like other strands that interact really fruitfully with the other plot and like thematic elements of the film. Right, because what's really scary about Michael is that alienness that mm -hmm. you can't understand him. Because the ending of this movie, it's very plausible to headcanon it as Loomis looked in that one spot, and what actually happened is Michael got up went five feet off camera and then died, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's totally possible of how this movie actually ended, is he just died in a different spot because maybe he isn't inhuman. Maybe he is just a sick kid and something's fucked up in his head. Um, and I love that it, it could be either of those. You know, it doesn't... It invites and refuses all readings. Um, yeah. Or the other ending of the movie is maybe he got up and just went back in the house, went up the stairs and just murdered both of them. Like that is also, that's one of the things about how suddenly the movie ends. So that is like a completely yeah. plausible interpretation. You know, if you right. ignore the fact that there's this whole franchise that's made afterwards, it's like very easy. You can just be like, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're going to get killed. Like momentarily, like they are on the edge of being murdered um, again by Michael Myers. And that is like what the ending implies is a perfectly reasonable interpretation of this movie. Yeah. One other moment in, in all of the, the Michael of it that I wanted to highlight talking about, you know, the sex and violence connection, and maybe there's other things to say here is, so you have the whole scene where the, you know, you have the woman and her, you have, uh, it's Linda and Bob having sex, and then Bob goes to get beer, gets killed, Linda's waiting, Bob, or the shape comes back in the dress with their, in the, with the, the ghost and everything, uh, and then kills her, but when he's killing her, he waits until she's on the phone. And then to Lori, it sounds like they're having sex. Yes. And it gets more sinister as it goes along because it goes from sex sounds to death sounds. But of course, the relationship between sex, death, and violence is all over this movie. And mm -hmm. in that moment, it's very much congealed into one kind of fucked up space. Yes. No, yeah. It's a very effective, like, melding of all those things that we have been building up, um, right? Because that is the... 
that is that action that then leads Lori to go into the house to set off the series of events for the climax of the movie. Um, so yeah, it's very appropriate that it is a moment that like merges a lot of like the different kind of motifs and, and thematic things that we have been seeing throughout the film with Michael. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, talking about Michael making Lori the perfect haunted house with the tombstone and everything. This is something I've always loved about Halloween is that it is like, if I had to categorize this into any kind of horror, to me it is a haunted house movie. Mm -hmm. But it's a haunted house movie where it's not someone else's house. They don't go to the Myers house in this movie. I guess Loomis goes there very briefly, but the Myers house isn't the haunted house. It's Michael brings the haunting with him and haunts their houses and the houses become haunted. Uh, and different Halloween movies have played with this in different ways. Like Rob Zombie's Halloween at the end has a phenomenal haunted house sequence of Michael going through and just tearing the place apart looking for Laurie. And it happens in the Myers house. But again, it's a much more literal version of that. Um, Halloween 4, which is again one of my favorites, has this... Basically, they go to the main character's house and they barricade it because they know Michael's going to come and it becomes a different kind of haunted house movie with that. But I always have, you know, and we've described it already, but I have particular affection for the way this movie kind of unexpectedly becomes a haunted house movie in that Michael makes it a haunted house. Yes, yeah, and it's, it's yeah, it's a great melding of kind of different horror elements because it is and it feels very intentionally it is a haunted house movie like it is specifically pulling on those elements and then i think carpenter makes it very explicit that that's what part of what he's doing with the the scene where laurie is discovering all the bodies that pop out at her like it's literally like not just a haunted house in a movie sense but a haunted house in a like theme park attraction sense yes yeah michael i <laughs> He's a creative boy. I don't yes. know. Maybe for evil. But, well, definitely for evil. I don't know what his exact intents are. But he, uh, you know, he makes a good haunted house. In a different life, he could have had a great time at Halloween building haunted houses. Yeah. Without no, actual corpses. Yeah, he like <laughs> very quickly sets all that shit up. You know, he's a very efficient, fast worker. You know, he walks slowly, but with like, like efficiency and intention. Indeed. I, you know, Michael has a lot of skills that it makes no sense he would have. It's also like Michael drives all throughout mm -hmm. this movie and all throughout the sequels. And there's nowhere in the story where he would have learned to drive. Carpenter himself makes fun of this in the audio commentary. There's even a line where Loomis says like, well, someone taught him how to. And I love the idea of one day we're going to get the inevitable Halloween prequel where we learn how Michael learned to drive. There was a kindly janitor who took him out on the weekends. Yes, and he, but he set up a whole series of events to manipulate the janitor into teaching him how to drive. Yes, it, it's a very elaborate yeah. uh, plot. Yes. No, um, love all of that. Here is something that we haven't talked about yet that you cannot talk about Halloween without, which is the music. Oh, yes. I mean, John Carpenter, one of the most incredible filmmakers ever, in part because he also composes the music for his movies. Uh, not all of them. Like, The Thing it has a very memorable Ennio Morricone score. Um but, you know, this is this is definitely his most famous score, obviously, yes. um, because it has become rightly iconic. And the main Halloween theme, it's the best for like any horror movie ever. Even the worst Halloween movies still have the Halloween theme. And that's something. But it's just all of the moment to moment scoring, the like different instrumentation used, the kind of cheap, simple way it's all put together it's so effective. It's such a good sort of tonal guide for the movie. He's so good at knowing when scenes should have music and when they shouldn't, which I think is an underrated part of the skill of film scoring. Mm -hmm. It's just another part of this movie that is masterful. Yeah, and it's it's always fun because it's like it's such a like a incredibly rare thing to have the director also be the composer for the movie. Um, but it definitely adds things to the movies that John Carpenter directed that he also composed the music for. Um, yeah, because as you say, I think I think that's part of what gives it this precision to how it is used, because all of it is being created, right? The shots are being planned and the music is being written by the same dude. Um, so it all feels like it is perfectly intertwined and it's all like of one creative vision because it basically is. Um, and then, yes, the core Halloween theme is just one of the great movie themes ever. Uh, it is incredibly iconic. It is the first thing that anybody knows about this franchise is they probably like he have heard the, th the theme song somewhere and then they saw the Michael Myers mask in some context. And there's like the first two things you're going to learn about this movie franchise, but everybody is going to know those two things because of how iconic it is. Um, and it's very simple, you know, it's like it's it's not a lot going on with it, um, but it is 
so effective at creating that sense of tension and mystery and suspense at not knowing what is going to pop out and where. Yeah. And that's just, this is one of those ways where Carpenter is just preternaturally gifted because he does not, to my knowledge, have any big formal music training. He said he doesn't read or write music, but he can play the keyboard. And you see this on through today, the the scores for the new David Gordon Green movies he wrote with his son, Cody Carpenter. Um, And it's still, there's just this in just instinctual understanding of when to deploy music, how to deploy music, what kind of music you want here. Um, and you know, just, there's very simple, but very strong theming going on. Cause Lori has a theme. The Halloween theme is basically Michael's. Um, but all of it, just the way it works, it's again, it's, it's, he is a preternaturally gifted filmmaker in all of these different ways. It's, it's a really amazing talent just to like, he just speaks the language of film so fluently. Yeah. And, and yeah, and it's, it's a score that like, I'm not necessarily going to go out and like listen to the Halloween theme on its own because it's, it just feels like it is music so specifically designed for the movie that it's in. Um, but that's what makes it as good as it is. This is probably going to sound weird. I have enjoyed over the last couple of weeks. I, after seeing Halloween ends, I did download the scores for all of the new movies and then the original Halloween soundtrack. And I've been listening to them a little bit while walking my dog around the neighborhood. There's something about like walking around with like the fall colors and a chill in the air and everything and listening to Halloween music. That's kind of fun. I know that sounds like I'm going to go murder people, but you know, keep in mind, not all of it is murder music. That's true. Not all of it is murder music. So you only murder people when the murder music (laughs) comes on and then the non-murder music will happen. You'll go back to being normal Jonathan. You know, Phoebe has a big vest on and I keep the kitchen knife up in there, you know, so she's carrying that around for me. And when the when the song comes on, that's when I pull the kitchen knife out and, and you know, she and I become partners in crime. And then, you know, like you start murdering people and the murder music happens and then like someone stops you and is like, Jonathan, you have to stop. And you, they rip the headphones off and you're like, and you come back to your senses, they drop the headphones to the ground, but then Phoebe hears it. And then Phoebe starts, <laughs> jumps up and grabs the guy by the throat and rips his throat out. Because it's, it's the murder music makes all of you uh, go fucking crazy. I'm turning around to look at Phoebe here. And she's just sitting on the bed, smiling with her tongue out, looking like a very happy, silly dog. Uh, so, you know, she likes your suggestion. Yeah, she knows what's up. Anyway, Halloween music is good. Uh, yeah. Yeah everything about this movie is good what are some other let's just hit some other little things i love i would be remiss if we did not mention the one thing i love in this movie which is that the film they are watching on tv throughout Mm -hmm. the whole film is the thing from another planet and it is just i think one of the coolest confluences of film history that carpenter put this in his movie because he loved this film and he pays homage and they're watching it and four years later, it's only four years. The thing is 1982, and you named your the best Halloween or horror movies earlier. I would put the thing in that same category because mm-hmm. it's a masterpiece. And he went four years from Halloween, putting it in his movie, to making a remake of it that is another of, I think, the best movies ever made. Yes, that is also, if you want to see how successful Halloween was, compare the production values of this movie <laughs> and The Thing. Um, because they are like on opposite ends of the like elaborateness of special effects. This movie has like kind of no special effects. Uh, Jar Carpers of the Thing is like full of the most elaborate prosthetic and puppet effects you will basically see in a movie other than maybe like David Cronenberg's The Fucking Fly. I, I mean, I think The Thing is in contention for the title of best special effects in yeah. movie history. Mm-hmm. Like if you were to try to pick what movie has the best effects, The Thing would have to be at a minimum on the short list. It yes. is that kind of movie. Yeah. Also, grossest special effects. Yeah. That that and the fly can duke it out for that title. Yeah, um, yeah but I'm 100% with you. I always love... It's like... It's a thing that's not really... Was never there as an Easter egg originally. But it has become a, like a weird trivia Easter egg. That in... You know, the, the movie that John Carpenter directed that got him big. They're watching The Thing from Another World. And then... Uh, then he, a few years later, gets to make his own remake of it. It is such a weird little detail, but it's so fun. Also, that movie, yeah. like the original The Thing, is fucking great. And I always love seeing... It's got that really great shot where all the scientists like stand with their arms open to try to measure the diameter of the... Or like the circumference of the UFO that's buried under the ice. I always love that like, 
I feel like he always puts some of the juicy scenes from that movie is what it gets cut to. And always you can tell it's like, yeah, he, he picked this movie very purposefully because he's always cutting to some of the best shit. Unfortunately, he never gets the shot at near the end of that movie where they fucking set the dude on fire. Because uh, that is also a crazy shot that also looks like all those people. <laughs> might have... It looks very dangerous. It doesn't look like a controlled <laughs> we set something on fire on the set. It looks like some of those people may have been actually burned because uh, it is crazy. But yeah, that's a great movie. And it, it is a weird trivia thing. Um, but you know that John Carpenter has to be a good director because he's got great taste in movies too. I've actually never seen the original thing from Another World, but I'm looking now and there is a Warner Archive Blu-ray remastered out right now that you can go buy and I will absolutely be buying it because that sounds great. Yeah, it's a great, um, it's a great, great I'm, movie. Yeah, I'm glad to know that has been preserved. Uh, Warner Archive does great stuff. But yeah, I love that. Um, and uh, I also love, I had to put this in my notes because it always makes me laugh. I love Lindsay, the uh, the, the girl that Lori babysits. <laughs> yes. Because the way Lindsay just sits kind of catatonic on the couch watching this scary movie that she's probably too young for and all of that is just the funniest thing to me. Especially at the part where you have Annie outside screaming for her because she gets stuck in the window. And Lindsay is just very nonchalant. And then maybe the funniest beat in the whole movie is Annie and Lindsay are walking back in and Annie says, you can't, now Lindsay, you can't tell anyone I got stuck, all right? That was embarrassing. And Lindsay's like, all right. And then she picks up the phone and calls Lori and goes, or no, she doesn't. She calls her boyfriend. He's like, hi, Paul. Annie got stuck in a window. And I'm like, man, Lindsay, you are savage, kid. That is brutal. Oh my God. She, nothing's as brutal as a little kid. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's because, you know, uh, Annie has built up a terrible relationship with this little girl. So it's like this, what you're asking for, you know, um, it's, it's one of those things of where, you know, it's, it's so different between when you get like Lori and was the name, like Tommy or whatever, like they're watching yeah. the movies together and they're eating popcorn and they're kind of talking about it and they're excited. And then you cut to Lindsay and she's just like, yeah, she's like a zombie watching this movie all alone. <laughs> Um, it's like not being sort of cared for not being paid attention to in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah, it's just, they really done. Like if there's anything that this movie is moralistic about, it's not about like, should you, or should you not have sex? It's like, you know, should, should you let, just let your TV raise your kids or should you care about your kids and like engage with them? Well, that's what this movie's like, Hey, fucking, you know, spend some time with your kids, people. Yes, indeed. It's, uh, it's, it, you know, and also like if you've got, if you've been paid to do a job, if you're paid to be a babysitter do your babysitting gosh yes. darn it <laughs> you know which i was a babysitter i cannot imagine uh trying to like unload the kids to go have sex with someone while babysitting that seems terrible yes yeah, so, and just like spending the entire time in another room on the phone talking to your friend um and then like the dog comes up and the dog starts barking and she's like Lindsay, get this dog out of the kitchen and then it just cuts to Lindsay just watching the fucking movie it's like what the fuck like fuck off lady like come on leave the kid alone or like go spend time with the kid not just try to like order them around i love Lindsay. i love the little indication that Lindsay kind of has a crush on tommy because that's how annie b- basically bribes Lindsay to go over mm-hmm. to Lori's. all of that stuff is hilarious um doubling back on the thing for just a second i forgot something that was in my notes that i wanted to say um Halloween, the 2007 remake by Rob Zombie. My biggest single disappointment with that movie is there's a scene where they're watching The Thing and they didn't update it to John Carpenter's The Thing. That would have been, to me, the obvious thing to do Mm -hmm. in the Halloween remake. They didn't do it. It's just still the original thing from another world. But then in Halloween Ends, there is a scene where there's someone being babysat and they are watching John Carpenter's The Thing. And I'm glad it took like 45 years. I'm glad we finally did that because it finally came full circle. It took 13 movies, but we, we worked that back in. I mean, it took so long that like probably contextually it's like, I mean, you wouldn't do, you know, I mean, because uh, I haven't seen that movie. They're, did they Are they watching it on fucking cable TV or did they put in like Basically. the Blu-ray? Because nobody, <laughs> yeah, nobody's, it doesn't make sense. nobody's babysitting and watching anything on cable TV anymore. It's like they waited so long that like society has changed to the point that you can't even do that sequence anymore. There's been another thing remake. There was the one from the yes. mid-2000s. I don't think anyone remembers it to like put it on TV, but it, it, it got lapped again. Well, it's te- that's technically not a remake. That's technically it's a, prequel. a prequel, Jonathan. So, yes. so, it's, so it's totally different. I've never seen that one. Um, no, nobody has. It. Okay. <laughs> it has Mary Elizabeth Winstead. It can't be that bad. She's, I like her. Yeah, she, she and her family are the people who have seen that movie. That's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. What else, Sean, do we need to say about the original Halloween? 
I think we hit all the stuff that that I really wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just it's an endlessly rewatchable movie. You know, it's yes. it's just one of those where it is the perfect Halloween movie, not just because it's called Halloween, but because it is so fresh to watch all the time. It had been a couple of years since I watched it, um, but mostly because I haven't used like it's been a, I haven't had like as much of like a Halloween tradition the past couple of years of how busy I've been. So it has been nice to be like, yeah, let's do this you know halloween that just i think this is the only time doing this podcast i believe where halloween has been on the day we put the podcast on because it's not usually at the beginning of a week it's pretty rare that it falls there so it's nice to be like yeah fuck it halloween man yeah. it's here well once every seven years and i don't know seven years ago if we were putting it out on mondays so i don't think so it, i think we were on tuesdays or something at that point yeah so i don't think we were done it it was like once i saw that also this is our 450th podcast so, you know, not the biggest milestone, but it is another 50 marker. And I think talking about one of our favorite movies is a good thing for that. But yeah, I, I will, I, you know, will hopefully for the rest of my life watch this every October because it is such a fun movie. And just, you know, you talked about this earlier, Sean, but it is just worth stressing how perfectly paced it is. It is amazing to watch any movie from any time where you look at it and you go, there is not, not only is there not an ounce of fat, it doesn't go the other direction either. There's nothing rushed or like left yeah. unsaid. Like I don't need, you know, the final scene that you're we're imagining where Lori is sad alone at the dance because her friends are dead and the boy she had a crush on comes over and invites her to dance and she smiles and sheds one tear. Like I, you know, it's fine. It's perfect the way it is, um, and it's just completely involving. It's you know the rare movie these days where I feel no compunction to get up or check my phone, mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I know everything that's going to happen, but it's just that damn good. Yeah, again, it, it is like the most coherent and concise argument for 90 minutes being the optimal <laughs> length of most movies. Um, is it's like, because again, it's it's 90 minutes and like 51 seconds or something. It's, it is just right there, um, you know. And it's one of the thing, reasons why John Carpenter is one of my favorite directors. He has never made a movie that is two hours long. He's never gone that far. He's got like, it's like 109 <laughs> minutes or something, I think is like the thing. And that's that's the closest he got. Um, it's like, fuck yeah. That's that's a man who knows movies, knows how knows what a movie should fucking be. And then Halloween You were on the movie. dot. The thing is 109 minutes. Well, I was looking it up last night because I thought, I, was, oh, okay. I, had, I had the thought like, has he ever even had a two hour long movie? And I looked and was like, yeah, not even. I was actually wondering if he ever even had a hundred hour or a hundred minute long movie. And he's got like a couple. Um, but yes, it is. It is. A, I think, yeah, you know, ahead. I think John Carpenter is the like most obvious heir to Hitchcock, honestly. Uh -huh. Like, I think in terms of his just fluency with film language, the kind of genre hopping he does, all of that stuff, the general creativity. Um, working within the studio system, but kind of bending it to his will. I, I don't know if he's often seen that way. You definitely do see, I think, a generation of scholars and critics who came up with Carpenter who are now, I, not rehabilitating, he never needed rehabilitation, but I think are properly elevating him into the canon. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that he's still alive to see some of that. Um, but it's it's just been cool to see. Cause, and there's a lot I haven't seen that I need to one day. You know, I've seen a lot of the ones we've commented on here, like The Thing and, and um, Assault on Precinct 13 and, and uh, Escape from New York, but there's others that I've always wanted to see and haven't. And one day I want to do a big Carpenter deep dive because it's always interesting. Yeah, it's a great filmography. Yeah, he's a great director. And it's one of the things with like, you know, with a lot of his movies, including Halloween, is like a lot of them at launch had relative, or at release had relatively mixed reception. There were people at the time that liked Halloween, um, but there, but a lot of like the mainstream critics had a very muted response to this movie and just treated it like another horror film. Um, and it wasn't until it like picked up steam. It was clear that it was like this big cult thing. I mean, it made like $70 million or whatever at the box office, like a huge success, particularly for a movie at that scale, a crazy success an unheard of success. Um, and then it starts getting reevaluated. Um, but now like, I feel like that happened with a bunch of his movies and now, you know, there are so many people that look back on stuff like that and they live or John Carpenter's The Thing um, and even stuff like Assault on Precinct 13 that are like really kind of underground and weird and, you know, super early. Um, but seeing them for like a this is like a genius filmmaker, like he is one of our great American directors. He should be treated as such. He wasn't always treated with that level of reverence during a lot of his stuff as it was coming out. But now I think 
everybody's on that page and and there is not a person that does not like john carpenter because he is both a great director and he's also just like a great person you know as you say like anytime you get a director's commentary or an interview with him um it's always he's very funny he's very like real he's very down to earth that like it doesn't feel like the success he got with a lot of this stuff has ever really gone to his head you know he will never bullshit you. It's yes. like very clear in interviews. He has no time for it. There was a story in the in the Halloween commentary that I found actually very touching where Jamie Lee Curtis said the first day of filming, they finished shooting. She had never been in a movie before. She'd been in some TV stuff. This is her first day. She was very nervous. And at the end of the day, she gets a, a call from someone saying, hey, John wants to talk to you. And she's worried, like, oh, my God, I did terrible. The director wants to tell you he's going to fire me. And John had just called her to say, hey, you did great work, and, and I'm excited for the rest of the shoot, and you did a good job. That, to me, is like, oh, my God, that's yeah. a great director. Like, you do not hear about that that often. And just knowing that this person probably, like, needed that just because this is all new and exciting, you know, it's cool. Yeah. So yeah. John Carpenter... And Halloween and all this stuff gets two thumbs up. Absolutely two thumbs up. Um, do you want to talk? Do you want to hear me talk about all the other fucking sequels? Yeah, I mean, because you've never... You just... This is a thing that's happening with you now. Where you just kind of decide to go <laughs> fucking crazy. You know, you watched all the Star Trek movies, including the bad ones. Now you've watched every single Halloween movie for seemingly no reason at all. Like, I didn't ask you to do that. You didn't say it. it, it, it I, don't, I don't know what the fuck you've been doing. So, yeah, you want to rank so, these movies okay, or whatever? It was, do you want... Let's see. I've got a short explanation and i got a long explanation. Short explanation is that uh, I have... You're wondering, like, why does Jonathan make all these lists and make himself get to the end of all these movie franchises? Yes, it seems like I have a semi-official uh, diagnosis of OCD at this point. Uh, I say semi-official because it's basically I realized something about myself and self-diagnosed and my therapist went, yeah, that checks out. Uh, <laughs> so okay. anyway, take that for what you will. Uh, second, longer explanation. Basically, it had just been Halloween Ends came out. I wrote this piece about those movies. I was kind of interested in this franchise. One day I was at Walmart, uh, which is where I sometimes buy groceries. And I there was a one of the bins of like the cheap DVDs. And they had both of the Rob Zombie movies, Halloween 1 and 2. And I'd always been interested in those. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I just bought those cheap-ass DVDs to watch those movies. I wound up watching those. I wound up watching Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which I'd always wanted to see. And at that point, I was in too deep. And the OCD part of my brain kicks in and says, you should just see the rest of them, Jonathan. The problem um, is, though, that most of the rest of them is the... Those are the ones, ones you don't yeah. really need to watch. Uh, you do if you want to be a completionist. Um, so anyway, there, and there were some other things like Halloween four had a special screening at a uh, film scene, which is our local theater here. And I thought that would be fun to go to. And it was fun to go to. I actually really liked that one. It's a lot of fun. Um, so anyway, I just was close enough. And then the other day I did have a moment of doubt where all I had left were the nineties Halloween H2O and Halloween resurrection. And I said to Thomas on the phone, I said, I don't, I just don't want to watch those. I, and I said, but the podcast is coming. I could rank all of them. And Thomas is like, well, you know what you're going to do. And I'm like, <laughs> and that was like, in some sense, the most brutal thing he's ever said to me. He could have said, don't watch them, Jonathan. You'll be fine. Why don't we play Call of Duty together or something? But he said, no, you know what you're going to do. And I went, yeah. And I logged off Splatoon and started watching Halloween H20. <laughs> and that's literally how that went. Uh, but as a result, I have seen all 13 Halloween movies and I am going to rank them for you and um, satisfy that part of my brain. Okay, just for context for me, like, I have not seen any of the, like, Rob Zombie on ones. I've always meant to see the Rob Zombie ones and just haven't gotten around to it. And I don't think I've ever seen to completion four, five, six, seven, or eight. Uh, God, there's a lot of these <laughs> movies. Uh, but I have seen chunks of all of those because back in the day you had this thing called TV that you would yep. just change the channel and it would be on. And I always liked watching horror movie marathon stuff but like i usually didn't watch the whole movie i would just check in watch like 20 minutes get, see like a cool kill and then be like yeah i think i'm good um you know like which one is it it's h2o the one that has the plot where it's like a reality tv show and they're going to the myers house that's resurrection okay resurrection i remember that one being the one that was like truly i watched a little bit of it i was like 
I'm good. <laughs> like, I, I can't. This is this is garbage. And I'm talking about, I was like 14. I was like, this is, I can't do this. Um, and and that's like my main memory of any of these movies is specifically that moment. Um, it's just being like, I just can't watch this anymore. Um, and I went and I, I changed the channel and probably watched fucking Law and Order or some shit. I will say, marathoning all the Halloween movies, vastly easier for me than the Star Trek ones. Because Star Trek starts with six... Uh, mostly great movies and then you get into the inanity of the next generation movies and then the bad J.J. Abrams movies and then you finally get a decent one with Star Trek Beyond um, Halloween none of these other than uh, from Rob Zombie on they're a little longer but everything before then is under 90 minutes or mm -hmm. around 90 minutes uh, and even when they're bad bad slasher movies are often entertainingly bad because they're fucking weird and sometimes just weird things happen that are fun to see. And so that is definitely a benefit from some of these movies. Uh, so I don't think I really suffered until the end. You'll see what's at the bottom of my list. But we'll talk about that. Um, I do also just want to, for people who maybe are listening to us talk and haven't seen a lot of the Halloween movies. I got to give you the primer. Because this is the weirdest series ever. Uh -huh. This franchise has five different continuities. Five. Three of which branch off from the original John Carpenter movie. So the three John Carpenter branching paths are: there is Halloween one, and then there are uh, then there's two sequels to Halloween one. There's Halloween two from 1981, and there is Halloween from 2018, the David Gordon Green movie, and then its sequels. And those are two branching paths. But then Halloween two splits off in two paths from that. Because Halloween 2, you could go on with Halloween 4, 5, 6, which are direct sequels to that, where Laurie has died in the interim and it's about her daughter, Jamie Lloyd. Or you can go over to Halloween H2O, which jumps ahead and there is no Jamie uh, and it is ignoring 4, 5, 6, but Halloween 1 and 2 still happened. And then there's Halloween 2018, which is where nothing except Halloween 1 happened. Then, uh, so you've got those three continuities. You have Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which is completely unrelated and is just its own continuity and has nothing to do with any of these. Uh, and then there is the Rob Zombie-verse, which is Halloween and Halloween 2. But not that Halloween and Halloween 2. It's Halloween and Halloween 2 from 2007 and 2009. Yeah, and you don't even have, like, the the courtesy of the of Modern Warfare, the new Modern Warfare 2, which the original Modern Warfare 2 is, the num is like, the Latin numeral 2, and the new one is the um, Roman numeral, you know, two I's. Both of these Halloween twos are the two eyes, so you can't even differentiate yeah. it that way. I know, it's brutal. So, let's rank these from worst to best, in my humble opinion, starting at the worst, number 13 is Halloween Resurrection, yeah. <laughs> the one you just mentioned. Uh, and my number 12 is Halloween H2O. And I have to tie these together, because they came out next to each other, mm -hmm. basically... How these ones worked is that this franchise just died a very hard death with Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. And what they did to bring it back is that for Halloween H2O, which was originally developed as a direct-to-video spinoff. That's where they were going to be going with this. But they got Jamie Lee Curtis back. And so Halloween H2O pretends that 1 and 2 happened. So Laurie and, and Michael are brother and sister, but nothing else happened. And the thing about watching Halloween H2O today is, one, it is the most 90s ass horror movie ever made. It is aggressively 90s. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. There are no movies that are bad in the way 90s bad movies are bad. Yeah. Bad 90s movies are the worst movies. And Halloween H2O is a bad 90s movie. It's basically a dry run of what David Gordon Green wound up doing with Halloween 2018, where it's we come back to Laurie years later how is she coping with this thing that happened to her as a teenager um and it just does it i think very haphazardly they give her a kid played by josh hartnett who's terrible um it's a very lazy movie it barely it's like 85 minutes long it barely gets started before it ends the only good thing about it is at the very end there's this great scene where they've seemingly killed the shape, but Lori knows he's not dead. So she hijacks the coroner's car that he is in and then drives him out to the woods, crashes the car. He is, Michael is pinned between the truck and a tree and Lori gets out with a fire ax and cuts his head off. And it is a fun, delirious ending to the movie. Not enough to redeem it. Then Halloween Resurrection happens. And what Halloween Resurrection does is, uh-oh, we killed Michael Myers. How do we fix it? Well, it turns out Lori didn't kill Michael. 
that was just some random paramedic that Michael put the mask on right. and crushed his windpipe mm-hmm. so he couldn't talk. So Lori did all of this and killed some rando. And at the beginning of Halloween Resurrection, she is in a mental hospital because she killed a rando. And then Michael comes looking for her and she actually traps him again. She almost kills Michael, but she hesitates because she needs to confirm it's him. And as she's pulling the mask off, Michael grabs her, stabs her. Lori kisses him on the lips of his mask and goes, see you in hell. And then she gets dropped to her death. Uh, And that's the first 20 minutes of Halloween Resurrection. The rest of Halloween Resurrection then shifts back to Haddonfield where there is a reality show company run by Busta Rhymes and Tyra Banks. Yes. Who are creating a reality show in the Myers home where they put all these dumb kids in the Myers house and they have to spend a night there. Uh, Well, it turns out that in this one continuity of Halloween, Michael has been living in the basement of the Myers house for 20 years and he's not happy that people have come and invaded his house. And so he kills them all. And at the end of the movie, uh, Busta Rhymes winds up seemingly killing him by electrocuting him in the balls and setting the house on fire. Uh, and it's the end of that movie is extremely funny and you should watch it because it's hilarious. The rest of that movie is mostly unwatchable and very, very bad. And these are, to me, the worst two Halloween movies. Yes, I that that is, without me watching them, that is my impression as well. Again, Halloween Resurrection, I, I forgot which ones were rich in what order it came in. Um, H2O, Halloween H2O is my favorite title of any of them yes. because it's so fucking dumb. To be clear, it's because it's 20 years after. So that's what the, the 2 o or the 20 it, is in the title. It's supposed to be H20, but no one says that because when you see H2 and a circle, you say H2O. Yes, um, and it's a great bad movie title. Um, but Halloween Resurrection with the fucking stupid reality TV show plot was the one that I, I just fully tapped out on. It wasn't a like, oh, a commercial break happened and let me like switch the channel. It was like, I cannot keep, wa- I cannot get to the commercial break. I'm just going to fucking bail on this movie right now. It's uh, it's truly terrible. These ones also have the worst Michael Myers mask because mm-hmm. it's not just a shitty mask. They also have his eyes fully visible all the time which is such a mistake you're not supposed to see his eyes they're supposed to be dark holes that's how dr loomis even describes it it looks bad um i think halloween h2o maybe in its time was more appealing because of the jamie lee curtis of it all but in a world where we have the new david gordon green trilogy that just does that much better you don't need halloween h2o you can ignore it all right my number 11 is halloween the curse of michael myers it's halloween six but they dropped the six Halloween the Curse of Michael Myers has two very different cuts. There's the original producer's cut that didn't make it to theaters, but has since been released on home video. And there is the um, original theatrical cut. And I have not seen the theatrical cut. I wound up what I downloaded was the producer's cut uh, because I have been assured by horror fans that that is the better one. And maybe that's true. This is still a horrible movie. This is the end of the 456 trilogy, which is known as the Thorn trilogy, because this is where we learn that Michael is part of a satanic cult that worships the sign of the thorn, and that when the thorn constellation appears in the sky, he is compelled by magic to murder the rest of his living bloodline, and that is why he does the things he does. This is the movie where you finally learn all of that. Paul Rudd is the star of this movie as Tommy Doyle, all grown up. Um, and he's very bad. He makes, or the director made performance choices for him of being kind of like a crazy person. And it's really awkward. You get some good Donald Pleasance in this one. Mostly this movie is extremely dull and nothing happens in it until the very, very end. And then just as it's getting started, it ends. This is also the movie with the plot point of uh, Michael being forced to rape his teenage niece, Jamie Lloyd, and impregnate her with a new baby who he then also has to kill. It's very bad. That, I did not remember that. I don't know if I got to that part of that movie. That is, that's bad. It's not in that's the, it's not in the theatrical cut. You uh, wouldn't have seen it in, uh, they cut that out. I wonder years. why. I wonder why they cut that out. Huh. The, what a mystery. We'll never yeah. know. My number 10 is Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, which is a pretty bad, unnecessary movie. Halloween 4, which was like the big return, it's literally called The Return of Michael Myers, is a really fun one that I think is genuinely quite entertaining. But it, like how it it doesn't like end super definitively but it ends in such a way that you have to be i think at least a little creative in how you would restart the story 
and they are not creative at all. And it's basically just Michael wakes up and starts killing again. It's extremely dull. They don't pay off on the end of Halloween 4 in any way. Uh, the reason it rises this high, or at least above 6, H2O, and Resurrection, is that the last half hour is a good haunted house adventure in the Myers house, which looks completely different than it does in any other movie. But there is some good action, including Jamie Lloyd, who's uh, the kid who's like the protagonist of these movies, like stuck in like a duct trying to hide from Michael, and he's like stabbing into the walls. So there's some good stuff there. Um, you don't need to watch it, but if you do, it's a little less painful than some of these others. All right. But I will say, those are the only four I hate. Everything else, these top nine, I genuinely, I will watch these movies again. There's things about them I enjoy very much. I think some of them are very interesting movies. So it's not all lost. Good to know. Yes, I mean, that's right. that's my impression as well. Um, yeah, that like five, six, seven, eight are not good. That's the nadir, yes. Yeah. So my number nine is Halloween Kills. This is the second entry in the new Halloween trilogy. I won't spoil anything from these because I know you haven't seen them, Sean, mm -hmm. and they're relatively new. Kills is definitely the weak link of the three. It is extremely weirdly shaped as a movie and doesn't have a good pace to it or a good kind of um, sense of energy. I think it, I will say this, it is called Halloween Kills and it does have the best kills of the franchise. Having now seen them all, it is the only one that I think has... Uh, the Rob Zombie movies too, but I think this one even more has a lot of like creative, silly, sometimes very funny, sometimes very gnarly death scenes. I think it has some really interesting meta stuff going on and it was kind of the impetus for me writing the big essay I did on the new Halloween movies. Um, but I won't deny that as, a, as its own film, it has a lot of problems. Okay, so that was my number nine, Halloween Kills. Very interesting movie, just not necessarily a great one. I would say the same about number eight, which is Halloween. Halloween the remake from 2007 by Rob Zombie. Okay, the remake from 2007. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yeah. I, I like this one. I think it's imperfect. I think what's interesting about this movie, and this is true about both Rob Zombies, is that Rob Zombie, one, very much put his own stamp on these. And I think that's great because he's a really interesting like idiosyncratic filmmaker with a voice mm -hmm. and that's better than a lot of the random bad Halloween movies that are just kind of anonymous he also took very seriously the idea that Michael and Laurie are siblings instead of that being kind of a shitty half thought through retcon it's built into these movies that he made for better or for worse and I think his Halloween 07 is it's kind of a two-part movie the first hour of it is all basically what the first scene of Halloween, the original 1978 movie is, which is Michael as a kid. You see Michael's daily life. You see his family life. It's very Rob Zombie with the crazy, you know, redneck family and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Building up to him killing. Then there's a bunch of scenes of him in the mental asylum. Dr. Loomis in these movies is played by Malcolm McDowell, which if you can't get Donald Pleasance, that's about as good a recast as I think you could do for Dr. Loomis. Yeah. And so Michael is very much the main character of this Halloween movie. He is there in every scene. He's the protagonist, essentially. Um, and then the second half of the movie, the second hour, and I'm not exaggerating, you meet Laurie Strode in the remake an hour into the movie. And the second hour is basically a pretty straightforward remake of the original. And I think that's where this movie loses me a little bit, is when it's recreating shots and scenes from the John Carpenter movie, it very much feels like a cover version of it. And it doesn't feel like it's doing anything too new with it. And I think it's making some pretty big mistakes. Like it does some of the POV shots and tracking shots, but you know where Michael is in every scene. Sometimes Michael is in those tracking shots and it doesn't make sense because it's not contextualized as much within that. Um, and I think it's less scary as a result. The very end of it, where you have a big kind of haunted house scene with Michael in the Myers house and Laurie, is good, and I like that. It's definitely worth seeing. It's an interesting movie. It's very Rob Zombie. I think the idea in the first hour that Michael emerges from like the collective unconsciousness of racist, bigoted rednecks is an interesting idea that only, I think, Rob Zombie would ever deliver. But it's interesting. I think, you know, I hope if they if they ever bring back Halloween again after Halloween ends, that they do this route. Not necessarily a remake, but they give it to another filmmaker like Rob Zombie who has their own 
vision and voice and brand that is theirs because I think that's the fun of this movie. Yeah, I've always been interested in checking those out because they've always seemed pretty cool. Yeah, they're de- also like this is a much you know more violent, gory version. Mm. Uh, I like the guy who plays Michael in these. It's Taylor. I think it's Tyler Maine is his name. And my three favorite Michaels are the original Nick Castle in the original one. I think Tyler Maine is good, and then I really like James Jude Courtney in the new movies. He's his Michael is just very well done. Um, but this is another one of the good ones, and the mask is good. Then my number seven is Halloween Two. But not the Rob Zombie Halloween 2. It's the original Halloween 2 from 1981, which is a very weird movie. It was made with John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's involvement. They wrote it. They produced it. It's directed by a guy named Rick Rosenthal. And this is the one that is in the hospital where Laurie is up in the hospital after the events of Halloween 1. It's a direct sequel, same Halloween night. Um... You know, it's infamous for introducing the twist that Michael and Laurie are siblings, but it's extremely obvious when you watch it that that twist was only introduced because there is a junction in the plot where Loomis has to go back to the hospital for the plot to continue, and it's unclear what will motivate him to go back there, and so his assistant just drops a truth bomb on us like, oh, by the way, did you read in his file that Laurie is his sister is basically what happens. And then Loomis is like, we have to go back. And that's what happens. Um, John Carpenter has said he thought it was a dumb twist and he wrote it. And I think this, that's why. Yeah. I think he was on a deadline and he wrote a stupid twist that later movies took too seriously. Other than that, Halloween 2 is fun. It's a much sleazier, trashier movie than the first Halloween but it still has some of the same formal characteristics like Rick Rosenthal tried to keep some of the, you know, tracking shots and all of that stuff. Um, it's got some good kills. It's the funniest thing about it to me is that it's a very weird movie with, I don't know if it's a sense of humor or it's just bizarre and doesn't know what, how it is reading to the audience. But like, there's a scene where there's a kid out on Halloween, like a teenager in a Mike in the same Michael Myers mask and Loomis freaks out and thinks it's Michael and is about to shoot him. But he doesn't have a chance to shoot him because a cop runs him over accidentally and pins him into a truck, which then explodes and burns the dude alive. That's the kind of weird shit that happens in Halloween 2. And then the whole hospital setting is basically like a level of Hitman, the video game, with Michael as Agent 47. And he is doing things like slashing the tires so no one can escape he's cutting the phone lines he's making it dark he's getting people into corners it's hilarious how much it's like hitman including my favorite part where there's a couple having sex in a hot tub and michael comes in and turns the temperature up until it's boiling and then they get out and the the boyfriend goes and checks and that's when michael kills him and then the woman is staying behind and michael comes up behind her and drowns her and burns her to death in the hot tub that is a hitman kill pure and simple and i love it is there, like, a conveniently body-sized box nearby that he drags the guy's body and lifts it up and throws it into the box and then, like, slaps his hands together? It's like, well, that's the doll in a day's work. There might as well be. I do think there's a scene. I think he kills a guy and then stuffs him in a box and then, like, Lori finds him or something. It's, it's crazy. Uh, but it's a fun movie. It's not great, but it's fun. Number six is Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. This is just a solid movie. This is... It's completely different from the original Halloween in that this is this came out in 1988 so years later and this is at the point where there's been a bunch of Friday the 13th movies and a bunch of Nightmare on Elm Streets and all the other ones and this is much more like how do we adapt Halloween to the slasher genre as it's evolved and so this Mm -hmm. is Halloween if it were a sleazy 80s slasher movie but I think it's a really well done version of that like it's genuinely very fun it's very funny sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally Michael looks like Michael Jackson in it he ragdolls a bunch in funny ways like the end of the movie is a truck chase where he comes he's like hiding under the truck like he's in Martin Scorsese's Cape Fear then he comes up and he's like they're trying to get him off the truck and he's holding on for dear life it's hilarious There's so much weird shit in this movie. It also has my single favorite Michael Myers moment that is not in the original John Carpenter movie, which is a scene where they've got this house on lockdown because they know Michael is coming. But of course, Michael gets in without anyone knowing. And at the front door, there had been one of the cops was sitting there in a rocking chair with a shotgun. He was rocking back and forth. And so at one point, this girl comes into the room and sees someone in the rocking chair and she says, oh, hey, officer, you know, what's your name? Um, what's going on? Is everything okay here? 
And then the guy gets up and it's Michael and he has killed the officer and he is sitting in the rocking chair with the shotgun to freak this girl out. But instead of shooting her, he uses the shotgun to impale her into the wall. <laughs> and that's how he kills her. Amazing fucking moment. <laughs> that's really good. That's very yeah. good. Yeah. My number five is Halloween. It's Halloween 2018, the David Gordon Green movie. Okay. Which is the the modern legacy sequel, Halloween. That's just a super solid movie. I don't think it necessarily breaks new ground. But it's solid. It's a fun return to form. It's what Halloween H2O should have been. I like that it's multi-generational. You have Lori, played again by Jamie Lee Curtis. You have her daughter, played by Judy Greer. And you have her granddaughter. And sort of the daughter and Lori are estranged, but Lori and the granddaughter are on better terms because Lori has spent her whole life waiting for the return of Michael Myers. Of course, he returns. He gets back to stabbing, and Lori is ready. What they basically do is combine Lori with Dr. Loomis for these movies mm. and give her all the crazy Donald Pleasance dialogue. And that's fun because Jamie Lee Curtis, in the 40 years since Halloween, has become a Donald Pleasance level, you know, character actor. Yeah. And she can do this. And she's fantastic. And, you know, there's a big scene at the end where, like, she has built her house to be a trap for Michael. And they go through all that, and it's great. It's a fun movie, and it's also got an original John Carpenter score, so how can you go wrong? Very good. Yeah. My number four is Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. It's not a Halloween movie, despite being called Halloween 3. It's completely unrelated because the plan was to make this an anthology series with a different Halloween story every year. That didn't pan out because people freaked out when Michael Myers wasn't in this, somewhat understandably because it is called Halloween 3. But it's anyway... Like, conceptually, it could have maybe worked if this had been Halloween 2. But the fact yes. that they made two Michael Myers movies and then they're like, now it's an anthology series is like, that 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 doesn't make any sense at all. But no, Halloween 3 is still very good. It's a, it, it's almost like a Twilight Zone episode with more gore because it's about this corporation that is making these Halloween masks and the masks are going to kill everyone. But I don't want to spoil how because it's gnarly as shit. This is the first Halloween movie that's like properly gory and it's got, other than like, the Rob Zombie movies and Halloween Kills, by far the best like moments of like gore and violence. Um, but it's got a bunch of great character actors. What I like about it is the main character of this movie is a shitty divorced dad who basically gets interested in the mystery because he's a shitty divorced dad and has nothing better to do um, and gets his life ruined. And it's amazing. And the end of this movie is one of the bleakest things I've ever seen, particularly for a like bleak gut punch about consumer capitalism. It's great. Uh, and it's just a solid 80s horror movie. Very good. Yeah. My number three is the other Halloween three, Halloween Ends. I know a lot of people are putting Halloween Ends at the bottom of their list because they hate it. I kind of get it. I also think a lot of people bought into the marketing of Halloween Ends and didn't give the movie itself a chance. Because what Halloween Ends is actually doing is by far, other than the next movie on my list, the most interesting different Halloween movie other than like Halloween three, which isn't a Halloween movie. It's playing with Michael Myers and with Laurie and with this lore in a really interesting way. And I think a pretty like emotionally resonant way. And it's stuck with me. I think it's a really interesting movie. And I, I just, for that alone, it kind of rises. These top three are the ones I think are like really, really worth it. And this is one of them. My number two is Halloween two. But the Halloween 2 from 2009 by Rob Zombie, which might be a fucking masterpiece, but it's hard to say because it is one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen. It is in the league of the weirdest studio released movies I've ever seen. Like, I can't believe Rob Zombie got this made on the budget it got made at a major studio. This went out into thousands of theaters and it is like full on avant-garde in places. It is extremely surreal it is all about dreams. Like Michael is being followed by the ghost of his dead mom through this entire movie. Um, significant portions of this movie are nightmare sequences. Um, it also has like these amazing moments of emotion and feeling. Like this, uh, Annie is in both of these, the girl from the original Halloween. Mm -hmm. There's a version of her here. She survives the 2007 remake. She gets killed in this one. And there are scenes of Lori and then her father, who in this one is played by Brad Dourif, both discovering the body that are some of the rawest expressions of grief I've ever seen on film. And there's all sorts of other weird shit happening. 
including some of the best and most brutal and crazy Michael Myers kills. Taraji P. Henson has a bit part in the beginning of this movie as a nurse, who I think holds the record for the most times stabbed by Michael Myers <laughs> in an amazingly violent sequence. Uh, see this movie. It's incredible. I've only seen the theatrical cut. I've heard the director's cut is even better. And I did just get a DVD in of that because it's surprisingly hard to find. They have not put the director's cut out on digital anywhere. The Blu-ray is very out of print, but you can find DVD copies of the director's cut. So that's what I have, and I'm going to watch it maybe maybe even tonight for Halloween. I don't know. But uh, I am curious about it because it's a fascinating movie. Yeah, I have, I'm have. i looking at the movie on Wikipedia, and I also see in the cast it says that Weird Al is in this playing himself. Yes. There is a talk show that Dr. Loomis goes on, and Weird Al is there, and Weird Al makes a joke comparing Michael Myers to Mike Myers from Austin Powers just fully collapsing the series in on itself, which is amazing. Very good. And then all, all it needs to do is, if only Rob Zombie could have made a third Halloween movie, you would have learned that actually it was Mike Myers the whole time. And, and Michael Myers takes off the mask and it's just Mike Myers. Thomas and I, my brother, were joking about this the other night, that there should be one there where they pull off the mask and it's just, you know, Mike Myers going, yeah, baby. It'd be great. It'd be very good. And then he rips that face off and it's actually Shrek underneath it the whole time. <laughs> Serial killers are like onions, donkey. Exactly. They have layers. And my number one is Halloween. Which one? Which one? I can't remember. Which one of the ones we've done? Which Halloween is this? This is the 1978 one that we just spent ah. two hours talking about. I think that's yeah. a pretty yeah, that's a pretty good movie. Pretty good. All right. My throat is sore from talking about all these fucking Halloween movies, but I did it. I watched them all. I ranked them all. My OCD compulsions are satiated. Sean, am I crazy? You know, I'm not qualified to say that. Uh, I'll just say I'm very excited for when you watch all the Friday 13th movies for next year's Halloween. 